All right, looks like we are live, and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's formal debate between Dr. Sam Frost and William Bell on the important topic, full preterism. Specifically, we are debating the proposition the resurrection of the dead has occurred in the past. And I got to say, it is a real privilege to have two very knowledgeable individuals, William and uh, Dr. Frost, to engage this topic. We host between four to five events a week, and I have been extremely excited uh, for this debate specifically. One could say this is one of our summer main events. And so again, William and Sam, it really is a privilege to have you both here to engage this topic. And before we get into opening statements, though, I'd like to uh, get acquainted, kind of break the ice, get to know our guests a little bit. Uh, William, why don't we start with you? Uh, firstly, how are you uh, tonight? And a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm doing fine for the most part. My air conditioner is out upstairs, and so it's a little hot. Uh, so I've had to work through that. But nevertheless, I'm grateful to be here. I appreciate the platform that you have presented. Um, I have been a full preterist since about uh, a little over 40-something years, uh, probably within about six months of, of becoming a Christian. And um, that all started, of course, with uh, looking at uh, a book by a gentleman by the name of Foy Wallace, who was kind of a partial preterist, but he was a full preterist for the most part on the book of Revelation. And so that got started. And then discovering a text in Luke 21, 22. So that's how I got started. And then um, after I started preaching on it, of course, um, I uh, came in contact with men like Ed Stevens and then Max King. And so for the most part, you know, I've been there uh, throughout the duration. Uh, I met Sam maybe, you know, some years ago. I don't know how, whether it was 11 years ago or more, uh, but it, it was a while back when we were uh, and we worked together for a little bit. Always appreciated him and uh, respect him highly. Um, I have a website, which is allthingsfulfilled.com. And uh, if you want any of the materials that I offer, you can go to allthingsfulfilled.com forward slash shop. I'm a minister for the Rains Road Church of Christ, which I've preached for for about the same time, uh, minus a year of the time that I've been a preterist. And uh, married three children, uh, four grandchildren, I think. I don't want to get that wrong. And, and uh, a couple of, uh, one great grandkid. So uh, with that, I am very grateful for this privilege of being here. Thanks to Sam for uh, the opportunity, as well as uh, to yourself for your platform. Absolutely, William. I really appreciate that introduction. This is a reunion of sorts, uh, Sam and William, since you both go way back, it seems. And to the audience, if you like what you're hearing from our guests, William and Sam, please do check the description box of this video. I do have the uh, relevant links uh, listed where people can find out more from uh, William and Sam. Sam, uh, over to you. Great to have you here as well. Uh, how are you? Uh, tonight. Hope you're as excited for this as, as I am. And also just a little bit about yourself. Um, <clears throat> I don't have any grandchildren yet at the rate. My, all my kids are in their 20s, but I don't have any grandchildren as of yet. So <laughs> at the rate they're going, I may not have any. I don't know. Um, but no, great to be here. Thank you uh, for, for this. And yeah, William and I go... Um, back i believe we met william back in 1999 2000 somewhere around there at various conferences in warren ohio colorado springs and different places where we were we were speaking at and um thanks for william for you know being here at the debate and uh my background i right now I, just where i'm at at present is um i'm an instructor at life bible college uh, papal new guinea and that started three semesters ago so that's very exciting to do that kind of um of work and then i'm an elder at bethel presbyterian church here in knightstown indiana so i like staying in the in the trenches of church work um where you know theology needs to be carried out i think um it stays too much in the ivory towers and it you know needs to be gotten brought into the church so um 
course, I have my doctorate's uh, degree, THM, Whitfield Seminary, Reformed Theological Seminary, Pentecostal Theological Seminary, uh, which William probably knows. That's there in Cleveland, Tennessee, Lee University. Um, so uh, published, uh, a few books out, commentary on Daniel, uh, Daniel Unplugged. And then most of my writing uh, is on vigil.blog, V-I-G-I-L dot blog. And my book published by uh, Dr. Kenneth Gentry's outfit, um, why I left full preterism, because I, I was in that in that movement, speaking with those like William Bell and Don Preston and, and, and the late uh, Max King, may he rest in peace. Um, and so being in that crowd roughly uh, 2003 to around 2010, um, when a lot of that kind of work was going on. So that's that's where we're at. And I'm in Newcastle, Indiana right now. <laughs> Very good, uh, Sam. I know how busy you both are. And so I do really appreciate the time you've given to us for, for this debate. We've got a lot of people in the audience already excited to see the both of you engage this, this topic. And I've personally seen uh, much content from William and also Dr. Frost, and these are two true professionals we have here tonight. So this is going to be an excellent debate. And for the audience's sake, I'll go over the format briefly. And so it is going to be a comprehensive debate as a debate of this magnitude should be, I'd say. And so we're going to be having 20-minute opening statements, followed by two rounds of rebuttal. So the first rebuttal is going to be 10 minutes. Your second rebuttal is going to be five minutes. Then we're going to jump into a cross-examination period. Everybody's favorite part of these debates where the uh, debaters can engage each other in uh, questions and answers. And so that'll be uh, 50 minutes in total. Basically, your first 25 minutes, uh, the affirmative being William Bell tonight, will cross-examine the negative. And then uh, for the second 25 minutes, we'll have the uh, negative cross-exam the, the affirmative. Then we'll have a five-minute closing statements where the debaters can wrap up their thoughts and points. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We'll have a roughly 25-minute audience Q&A. So please, if you do have a question for our guests tonight, just let me know who the question's for, William or Sam, and tag me, either at Donnie or at Standing for Truth, and that way I won't miss your question. And with that, we're going to get right into our first 20-minute opening statement. And so, William, whenever you're ready, just let me know. I can start your timer, and the floor is all yours. Okay, I am ready. You're good to go, William. All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for your attention tonight. I am affirming that the resurrection of the dead, as spoken of in scripture, particularly in the context of 1 Corinthians 15, is fulfilled, since it falls under the definition of Old Testament prophecy, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, uh, also verse 54, all Old Covenant prophecy has been fulfilled. This includes all eschatological prophecies, including the coming or the parousia or an, an epiphania or the appearing of Christ, the establishment of and perfection of the kingdom, the arrival of the new heavens and earth, the eschatological judgment and resurrection of the dead, as we said. Now, our focus tonight is on the resurrection uh, of the dead, meaning the dead ones. In order to further establish my proposition, I want to define the dead as spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When Paul speaks of the dead from the plural necron, he is not speaking of dead physical bodies. He does not use that term or phrase. Rather, he is speaking of the pre-cross saints of the old covenant who are yet under the power of sin and death. Hebrews 9 and verse 15, uh, Jesus was the mediator for the transgressions which were under the first covenant. And according to Hebrews 11, 39 uh, and 40, they had not yet been perfected or released from their sins. The death or the death that they had died as the covenant people was sin debt, as Hebrews 9, 15 states, as I said, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions, which were under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So that is not a denial that redemption from sin began through the cross. 
but that it was a process consummated at the end of the age in that generation, according to Ephesians 1, verse 7, verses 13 and 14, also Ephesians 4 and verse 30, Luke 21, 28 through 32. The scriptures teach that the law was a shadow of the good things that were about to come and not the very image of those things, but they could never, with those same sacrifices which they offered continually year by year, make those who approached perfect. As he said, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshippers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. Hebrews 10, verse 3, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. So all of these, as I said, Hebrews 11, 39, who had a good report, did not receive that promise. That promise was the promise of resurrection. Uh, Hebrews 11 uh, and, and verse 40. Now, this can be summed up in several scriptures, and we'll try to go through these uh, rather quickly because I know it's not much time. Uh, Acts 17, uh, 30 and 31, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he is about to judge uh, the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, and he has given assurance to all uh, of this by raising him from the dead. In Acts 24, 14 and 15, he says, but this I confess to you, this is Paul when he is uh, denying uh, the accusation of the Jews who were against him, saying that he taught things contrary to the law. He says, uh, according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept that there is about to be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. And then concerning judgment in verse 25, he reasoned with uh, Felix about righteousness, self-control and the judgment about to come. And in Acts 26, 22 and 23, he says, therefore, having help from God, this to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said were about to come. In 2 Timothy 4, 1, he says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 5, he was ready to judge the living and the dead. 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things had drawn near and therefore be watchful and serious in your prayers. And verse 17, for the time has come that the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will the end be of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Jesus said in Luke chapter 20, uh, one verses 20 through 22, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that the desolation is near or it's desolation. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the countries enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And he's quoting from Deuteronomy 32, which Moses said uh, regarded the things of Israel in their last days. Uh, in Matthew 24, 34, he said, assuredly, I say to you, uh, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Same thing in Luke 21, 32. Now in Acts chapter three, verse 21, the scripture is presenting to us a couple of things. One, a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 18, but also a quote from um, Genesis chapter 12 and verse three, where God said he would bless all nations through Abraham. And uh, as a result, Peter takes up that passage and tells us that it relates to the resurrection, but he also describes the nature of the resurrection in that text. So uh, the text says, repent, therefore, verse 21, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the age began. Uh, this is a parallel to Luke 21 and verse 22. And then he starts with Moses. He says, for Moses um, truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him shall you hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow as many as have spoken, notice, have also foretold these days. So Peter was talking about something uh, that was taking place in the very days in which they were living. Now, he says to his audience, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Acts 3.25, to you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Now, I do not believe there is a legitimate chapter division between verse 26 and between the next two verses in the uh, text of Acts, which is Acts chapter 4 
And as a direct result of the preaching of the apostles, the scripture says, now as they spoke to the people, so this is a continuation of that discussion, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So what Peter is saying is that the resurrection from the dead was the turning of Israel away from their iniquities. In addition, Paul cites the same text when he speaks concerning the nation, saying in Galatians 3 and verse 8, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the nations through faith, preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying in you, all families of the earth should be blessed. So Paul used it to talk about justification from sin in the same manner that Peter did. And of course, they were talking about things in their generation, as he said in Acts 2.40, save yourselves from this uh, untoward generation or this perverse generation. Again, a quote from Deuteronomy. Now, first and foremost, the resurrection of the dead refers to the raising of old covenant Israel out of the true exile of sin and the death caused by it that separated them from God. This death of exile began with Adam in the garden and continued under Moses' covenant for the people of Israel. In Romans 5 and verse 12, the text says, Therefore, just as one man or through one man, the sin entered the world, and the death through the sin, and thus the death spread to all men because all sin. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, the death reigned from Adam to Moses. So whatever this death is, it only reigned from Adam to Moses. We're no longer under the covenant of Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was about to come. Then in verse 19, uh, or in verse 20, he says, moreover, the law entered that the offense, that's the same offense of Adam, might abound, but where the sin abounded, the grace abounded much more. So that as the sin reigned in death, even uh, so the grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord or to the life of the age. So Jesus refers to this exile in the Gospel of John when speaking to those Jews who believed on him. He said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And the truth shall make uh, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Now, this statement puzzles some of the Jews in the audience, and they directly address the subject of their exile by saying, we are Abraham's children and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you should be made free? Pointing directly to the fact and nature of their exile from God, Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave or bond slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So he wanted to turn their attention to the true exile that man was suffering all the way from Adam down through Moses. And that was separation from the father caused by sin. And as such, they would not remain in the father's house, but be cast out as a slave uh, that did not remain forever. So that's spiritual bondage and exile. And interestingly, Jesus goes back to the garden to talk about their father, the devil, uh, as he relates that by saying that he was a murderer from the beginning and did not abide in the truth. Now, this pattern of exile was expressed in the time of Israel's national history through her foreign capture of oppression and captivity. They were exiled in Egypt uh, after the king died that uh, after a new king arose that did not know Joseph. Uh, they were also exiled in Assyria in 722 BC and in Babylon, as recorded by the prophets Moses, Isaiah, Hosea, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Moses records the exile in Egypt. Isaiah and Hosea uh, prophesied of the Assyrian captivity. And uh, of course, we have you know Daniel and Jeremiah talking about the Babylonian exile. And in each of these exiles, they were described as dwelling in the dust while under the rule of foreign powers. Each of these captivities had been caused by Israel's sins and rebellion through idolatry and harlotry, going after foreign gods and other transgressions in the law. In Isaiah 26 and verse 13, he talks about foreign rulers who had uh, dominion over them, but they were dead and thus would not rise because when God freed them from the captivity, that would be God raising them out of the dust. The same idea is found in Ezekiel 37, but it's particularly found in Hosea chapters 1, chapter 2, chapter 6, and also chapter uh, 13. All of these describe the national captivities and exiles of Israel 
However, they are types of the true exile that Jesus came to deliver them from. And thus uh, the resurrection that they are spoken of in bringing them out of the dust, which was a position of shame, of weakness, of a foreign power ruling over them, et cetera, is what was meant in those cases. And in the case that we've seen with sin and death reigning, that was the foreign power reigning over the people of God that Jesus came to deliver them from. Now, next, I'd like to talk about the last day. Uh, the last day focuses particularly on the time of the resurrection. And we will show the correlation, if we have time in this discussion, with its harmony with uh, the Hebrew festival calendar and the feast days, which are found in Leviticus chapter 23. For now, I would like to go to the very last feast of those holy convocations or dress rehearsals that were for Israel's end time, namely the feast of Sukkot or the feast of tabernacles, which occurred at the end of Israel's harvest season. According to Leviticus 23 and verse 36, in the seventh month, which was Tishri, that was a post-exilic name for the Hebrew month Ethanim, the seventh month per 1 Kings 8 and 2, the Feast of Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles was to be observed for seven days. The text says, for seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly and you shall do no customary work on it. Observe that after the seventh day, there was another day called the eighth day, which we know as Shemini Atzeret. This was the last day or the great day of the feast of Sukkot or Tabernacles. In the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to this day as the last day. It was not the last day of time or the last day of the physical world, but it was the last day or the great day of the feast. Now, when you're reading the Gospel of John, and you see the last day in John 6, 39, verse 40, verse 44, 54, chapter 7, 37, 11, 24, and John 12, 48, you should not be thinking as futurists think of the last day of time. Rather, you should understand this to be the last day of the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles, which was the eighth day, but it was also a day of new beginning because it was uh, that eighth day uh, that they were celebrating in view of the, the harvest. Jesus said to them in John 7, 37, if anyone comes to me, let him come to me and drink. Now, this was on the last day of the feast, that great day of the feast. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The last day of the typological feast occurred right there in John 7, 37. According to John 7 and verse 2, it was the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. And so ask yourself how many times Israel had experienced, quote, the last day in their national history, at least about 14 to almost 1,500 times or more since the institution of that feast by Moses, for it came every single year and would go every single year. Now, how many Israelites do you think understanding the Feast of Tabernacles would think that that was the last day of time? They had no such concept in their, um, in their minds and in their, their culture. And so this was simply uh, the Hebrew festival of Shemini Atzeret, that last day, that great day of the feast. And so we should not be taking those verses and in trying to interpret them outside of Israel's festal calendar and the temple typology that we find. That is how we should understand the last day. The last day prefigured the end of the harvest, just like the Passover prefigured the beginning of the harvest in the month, according to Exodus 12, 1. The last day never, ever, ever meant the end of time, but also, but always a consummation of the Feast of Tabernacles and the start of a new beginning. Now, during this feast, which marked the end of the summer drought, the Jews began praying earnestly for rain. According to F.F. F. Bruce, during the feast of uh, during that feast, a priest would lead a procession to the pool of Siloam, fill a golden pitcher with water and pour it on the west side of the altar on the morning of the offering of the sacrifice in celebration of the fruitful harvest. Jesus, as our high priest, steps into this picture on the last day, that great day of the feast, and says, those who are thirsty, let him come to me and drink the living water, which he had already referred to in uh, John chapter 4. And in that same context, talked about the temple, which when you see in Revelation 22, you see the river of the water of life flowing from that temple. And that refers to the salvation from their exile uh, in, that, in that, um, that reference. So living water marked the end of Israel's dead or dry season of no rain and the end of the harvest with celebration, rejoicing, thanksgiving. It is symbolic for resurrection. 
Now, the eschatological harvest is mentioned in John chapter 4, verses 35 through 38. The scripture says, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, he didn't go up because the Passover was 2000 years away. He went up because the time for the Passover was at hand. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. That was the Feast of Tabernacles when they saw the signs which he did. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And then the text says he needed to go through Samaria. Now, he told them in verse 35, he says, do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Now, that was the typological harvest. That was Israel's agricultural harvest with that four months between May to September that was in between before they got to the time of the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. And so he says, don't say that there are four months until that time. Y'all have to excuse me because my air is out up here. And um, so he said, for they are already white for harvest. He didn't say 2000 years later. He says they are already white for harvest. Now, when people use 2 Timothy 2, I think verse 18 against us and try to say, well, the Bible says the resurrection is past already. What about this text here in John where Jesus said the time for the harvest was ripe already. And uh, he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for, notice, the life of the age, eternal life that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. So we're not talking about some, uh, we're not talking about something disconnected with eternal life or the living water, et cetera. This is the resurrection. And the time was already right there in the first century. He says, for in this saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored and others have labored and you have entered into their labors. Now, according to Matthew 30, 13, 39 and 40, uh, the Bible says the harvest is the end of the age. And so we've connected that with the Feast of Tabernacles. And um, the Feast of Tabernacles was being ce celebrated right there in the first century in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 22 and verse 23. But particularly verse 23, I believe it is, where he talked about they had come to this uh, general assembly. Well, that term in the Greek is a festive occasion, a festal occasion. That is the Feast of Tabernacles because they are in Mount Zion in that text, which correlates with Revelation 7 and verse 9, where the 144,000 and the innumerable assembly, just like in Hebrews 12, have palm branches in their hands by which they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. And you see them again in Revelation 14, verse uh, 1 and 4, as the first fruits. And only first century saints could be first fruits. So, and then in the same chapter, they were receiving the kingdom of God. They were in their flesh and blood, but they were not of flesh and blood because they had been born again, John 1, 12 and 13, John chapter three, and therefore they were in the spirit. It looks like I'm out of time. I didn't get halfway finished and um, that's about it. I don't even have time to start another argument. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you for your time. William Bell, thank you very much for that 20-minute opening statement. I understand 20 minutes really does fly by in these kinds of debates. So I appreciate it. To the audience, uh, I am all caught up on questions. A lot of people asking how to get your question in there. Uh, if you have a question for the debaters, just let me know who it is. And then also tag me at Standing for Truth. And then that's probably the best way I won't miss it. Okay, so with that, uh, Dr. Frost, we're going to now hand it to you. And you have your 20-minute opening statement. And so whenever you're ready... Just let me know. The floor is yours. Yeah, I'm ready. You're good to go. Um, so the resurrection is the hope wherein all those who believe in the work of God established in the man, Jesus of Nazareth, who died and was buried and now lives as our intercessor at the right hand of God. It is first affirmed that Jesus of Nazareth, the human being, made like unto us in every way, did indeed die. And numerous scriptures were presented with this fact. And when John turns and sees the one who's speaking to him in the opening of his revelation, he sees the human being, the son of man, Revelation 113, standing before him in real time. This human being states quite plainly, I am he that died and am now alive, Revelation 118. And this important attribute of Jesus of Nazareth is repeated in Revelation 2, 8. 
we find that Paul, when confronting certain men among the Corinthian believers who say that there is no resurrection of the dead, reminds the believers that Jesus died, was buried, and is now risen from the dead. The direct connection between the resurrection of Jesus and the dead ones, plural, is that if the dead ones are not to be made alive, then Jesus has not been made alive either. However, if Jesus is risen from the dead and still alive after he has been raised, reigning, 1 Corinthians 15, 23, until he devours the last enemy, which is the death, then the dead shall be raised when the death is swallowed up in victory. The connection between the death and the dead are plain. In Acts 2.24, Jesus is loosened from the pangs of the death. And it is this, the death, that we find Paul using throughout for the death that came through Adam in the beginning, Romans 5.12, when he begins his whole argument there. Indeed, in Isaiah 25.8, which Paul quotes, states that in the Hebrew and in the Greek translation, Paul knew that God will swallow up the death. So what is the death? And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering that is cast over all peoples and the veil that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up the death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from off all the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it. And it shall be in that day. Lo, this is our God for whom we waited, that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we waited. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Remember, I started with, for it is in this hope we are saved. Do we not find all of the New Testament encouragements in the faith here in this one passage of Isaiah? That is, a coming day, wherein the Lord shall bring to nothing all of the powers of the death and all of the powers of evil, the powers of sin and wickedness. And that until then, the faithful are to wait upon the Lord so that he would save us. And in while we're waiting, we rejoice because it is in the hope of what we know that the Lord will do. Notice that the facts that the whole world is covered, all the nations and all the peoples, and that the day will come when the death is holy and completely destroyed, not for some, but for all. Paul quotes this very verse in his delivery to the Corinthians. And we find the same verse in Revelation 21.4. Isaiah 25.8 is quoted in Revelation 21.4. There shall be no more the death, it says. In the beginning of John's revelation, he saw that Jesus holds the keys to the death and the grave. And yet we see a horse with the death and the grave following behind. This horse, even though the lamb has ascended and he's opening the seals, and even though all power and glory and honor and dominion has been given to him, and even though he himself is one slain by the death, yet lives forevermore at the right hand of God, nonetheless orders the fourth horse of the death and the grave to do what it is that they do. Their keys, the keys of the death and the keys of the grave, are in his hands. He has authority over them, yet they still ride. However, in concert with the Apostle Paul's revelation, in the end, John sees the death and the grave being hurled or destroyed or swallowed up in the lake of fire. And this is in conjunction with the dead standing before the throne of Revelation 20 and 21. The righteous and the unrighteous, the small and the great. In other words, the resurrection of the dead is of all men and women ever, when all peoples of the earth shall be judged, as Paul stated. For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. All, not some. All. So we can see here that the death that is mentioned in relation to Adam and the death that is carried from Isaiah is the same the death that is held that held the body of Jesus for three days and which loosened him from the dead, according to Acts and Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. Since he is now risen from the dead, from the chamber of his tomb, wherein he was buried. If Jesus has been raised from the pangs of the clutches of the death, 
the same the death that covers over all the peoples and all the nations, the same the death that shall be swallowed up once and for all time in the lake of fire, then we can see that the pangs of the death that were loosened for Jesus of Nazareth will also be loosened for all the nations when they stand, good and bad, before the throne of God. He has the keys of the death and in his hands. The same the death that rides still on his horse, and the same the death destined for complete and entire destruction. Paul reiterates this same message quite simply to his non-Jewish audience in Athens, concluding with this, Acts chapter 17. God, listen to Isaiah, listen to Paul. God has appointed a day in which he shall judge the world through a human being, Jesus, and he has given us proof of this in raising him from the dead. But if Jesus is not raised from the dead, there will be no judgment of the world. If there's no judgment of the world resurrection of the dead, then Jesus has not been raised because the purpose that Jesus was raised was to bring about resurrection of the dead. And that's Paul, 1723 of the book of Acts. All of the constituent elements are there. Day, judge, Jesus, resurrection of Jesus. Therefore, the resurrection of the dead to stand for judgment. How can the world, since the time of Adam, now long dead, be judged in a coming future day? They must be raised from the dead. Death must be swallowed up, therefore, loosening its pangs and its holds it currently has on them. We find these images over and over again in the Bible for the great Christian hope. The language, if we follow the law of parsimony, is plain, it's clear, it's universal. But for my opponent, Mr. Bell, none of what I have said above is true. All of it is redefined, refashioned, and refitted to 70 AD. 70 AD is the framework, the end, and therefore all prophecy is fulfilled by the time of May 9th, 70 AD. At some time when Titus is watching the burning temple in Jerusalem, Mr. Bell cannot go beyond that date. August 9th, 70 AD, Tisha B'Av, as the Hebrews call it, a day of mourning, is the last day for Mr. Bell. And on that day, the temple burned. But according to their understanding, the dead were also raised in that day. And as Mr. Bell would have it, the corporate dead of Israel was raised complete with the corporate body of Christ on that day, the month of Ab. But for Paul, the dead and the living were all changed in that day too. The dead would be changed and the living would be changed. How were the saints living in Parthia or Thessalonica or in Upper Gaul changed on the 9th of Ab, 70 AD? while well, the temple, which signals the end of the age for Mr. Bell, was burning. Death is removed from the living who become immortal and the dead who are raised immortal. How did that happen to the living in that day, the month, at that time? Mr. Bell wants to make resurrection a process that was ongoing. Imagine water working through a bowl of flour, which processing it works it into a dough. The action is continuous until so processed. Well, what then of the fact that Paul uses the future in 1 Corinthians 15? The dead will be quickened, future active indicative, will be changed. The idea of the future is set because the death is destroyed when and then comes the end. He reigns until he abolishes. Jesus has the keys of the death and the grave in his hands and until he abolishes them in the lake of fire once and for all. That's the image and consistent picture that arises. But Mr. Bell is going to desperately try to convince you that the temple burning in 70 AD, the 9th of Ab, signaled to the world, to the saints, the dead, and to all the principalities and powers, the evil powers, and to all the wicked, that there is no more death, no more devil, no more grave, no more pain, and no more sorrow. That at that time, the glory of the Lord was manifested to all flesh, and they all saw it. And that the whole inhabited world at that time was judged. Yet he will use this language, but watch how he reduces it to merely nothing. Literally to mere symbolic language, apocalyptic language, 
uh, some kind of unique riddle language, speaking in code, not in terms you and I know, but in code terms, representative judgment, corporate death, sin death, and such terms that hardly relate to the everyday saint and the Bible reader. No, one first has to buy into the system of Mr. Bell, which he, uh, in his opening, outlined uh, in, in predictive fashion, uh, bringing in the time texts, bringing in the aspect of corporate body resurrection and all of that, bringing in the notion that of an Israel only kind of focus. So you have all of these types of things. You have to buy in first into the system. And one of the first things that appears on the surface is the time text, which is the hook that Paul Preterist draws one in in making 70 AD the fulfillment of every single unfulfilled prophecy ever written in the Bible. And then living on this side of 70 AD or post 70 AD, we still get to play church. Now, the resurrection of Jesus is something that historians, liberals, critics, Bible believers, we debate the historical resurrection of Jesus. But the resurrection of the dead is not presented as something in the Bible that we're going to be debating as to whether or not it happened. When the resurrection of the dead takes place, there's no debate. We don't debate over something like this. There are some things in the Bible that we do debate on, but some things in the Bible we don't debate on. For example, uh, Jesus being the Lamb of God in Revelation. That seems to be pretty clear. I don't know of anyone that denies that Jesus is not the Lamb of God represented in the book of Revelation. And in the same fashion, the resurrection of the dead is presented to us. But because you have a 70 AD idea that limits and locks, it locks. And I speak from experience because I used to speak on the podium with Mr. Bell and I was a full preterist myself. And I believed it and I uh, fully gave my life to it, hook, line and sinker. I saw it for what it was. But then I began to see that there's a larger picture going on here that cannot be reduced to 70 AD without truncating the Christian message in and of itself entirely. And that's what I mean by post 70 AD, because after you have all of these things destroyed, after you have all of these things uh, fulfilled, after you have the end, and after you have all of the promises and all of the things that God has said fulfilled in 70 AD, and yet you still have 2000 years of us living here on history, You've got to account for that. What have we been doing? Where are we going? What's this all about? And does anything in the New Testament, since everything was fulfilled for them in that generation, apply to us today? And how do you begin to separate what only applied to them in the first century generation and what applies to us today? And this is the big, giant, huge elephant in the room that is in full preterism today uh, as they begin now to attack each other, which is what they're doing. And not only that, they don't even agree or have unity on what the resurrection of the dead is, because there's a whole other faction of those that believe in the individual body at death view. When you die, you get a body in heaven. That's not William's view. He has a whole other view. That's called the corporate body view. And the full preterists go at it. Uh, the way that they do. And then there's a, there's a few other new forms of full preterism that are arising because I keep, even though I have left the movement as a whole, I still keep my finger on the pulse um, and get feedback on what's currently going on in the full preterist world today. So they're not all in agreement. Full preterism is not this monolithic kind of thing where everybody's all in agreement and they've uh, all had this happy shared kind of thing. The one thing that they are in agreement in is that everything took place in AD 70. It's the working out of what that means for us today, 2000 years, what has God been doing? What are we supposed to do? Uh, do we obey the law of Moses? Uh, do we do we not do, uh, do what? Uh, which G, what verse applies to 70 AD? Which one doesn't apply to seven? What ethic? What where? Who? So I don't have a hope anymore. When I debated Michael Miano, uh, he said that the resurrection of the dead in John 6 no longer applies to me or anybody else, really. So I don't even have the hope of resurrection anymore because that doesn't apply to me. It's been fulfilled. The resurrection is past already. That's what they're saying. That's what William Bell has just said. The resurrection of the dead 
is past already. And so now I live my life here on earth and then I die, uh, which is as natural as apple pie. Had Adam sinned or not sinned death, he still would have died because death has nothing to do in William Bell's view, has absolutely zero to do in Max King's view or Don Preston's view, doesn't have anything to do with biological death. You know, the one that we experience every day. So to get to the Bible and to understand what Hamavit means, death, or Hathanatos in Greek, uh, to understand what that means is not what you think it means. It's corporate death. It's sin death. It has nothing to do with your biology. It has nothing to do with funerals. It doesn't have anything at all to do with any of that whatsoever. So all of the passages at funerals and the hope and Thessalonians is quoted. And I have a funeral manual. And as a minister, I've had to preside over many funerals, unfortunately. And first Corinthians is read and John six is read and all of these in the common book of prayer of England is read and all, but that's all misapplied so you can't apply any of that because that's all 70 AD stuff and primarily it has to do with the corporate resurrection of the body of Israel in Adam being raised as the corporate body of the elect Israel in the body of Christ which was fulfilled in 70 AD if you can get all that that's 70 that's that's resurrection of the dead if you can get all that out of the Bible but see <clears throat> that's probably one of the most difficult things uh, that I had coming into this idea back in 91, 92. And so I got a hold of a book by Max King. And then I called Max King in Warren, Ohio. And we went around for about a year until the light bulb went off. And I figured out what it was that he was saying. In other words, it takes a lot of thinking, a lot, a lot of studying to begin to be, uh, formulate this idea of what Max is saying about corporate body resurrection. It's not simple. It's not simple at all. It, it took me quite a while. And then I saw it and over the dinner table with Max King at his house going back. And then finally, the it, I got it. I saw it. I saw what he was saying. <clears throat> and why did I go with it? I went with it and we can get into this, but I went with it because I was limited by 70 AD. That's my end point. I can't go beyond that. So 70 AD must absolutely must be this end point of resurrection of the dead if all prophecy is to be fulfilled and obviously bones and bodies and catacombs and tombs were not raised in 70 AD because archaeologically we can go back and we can bury them and we find mummies and bones pre 70 AD so obviously that cannot be resurrection of the dead well then what is it well we got to come up with something we got to come up with a, a 70 AD explanation for resurrection of the dead enter Max King and he does he does. I will, I will credit him for that. He's, he's, he, he definitely does. Um, but does it work? That's, that's the thing. Does it work? Because to get there in that system, in that end of defining what resurrection of the dead actually means, you have to first buy in to the whole other system of the time text and getting into and, and being lured into 70 AD being the end point. And I see that I've got 19 uh, minutes and 30 seconds. And so I'll conclude there. Thank you. Sam, thank you very much for that 20 minute opening statement. Gentlemen, good job to the both of you. That concludes the two 20 minute opening statements, both affirmative and negative. Lots of points on the table okay. for us to engage. And so we're now moving into our first rebuttal of tonight's debate. The first rebuttal round will comprise 10 minutes. And William, whenever you're ready, you get your 10 minute rebuttal. The floor is yours. Okay. All right. Um, once again, I am grateful for the opportunity to be here. Now, Sam said that resurrection is the hope uh, either in man or of man. Of course, according to the Bible in Acts 28 and verse 20, it says uh, Paul was bound uh, for he with a chain for the hope of Israel. And again, in Acts chapter 26, 6 through 8, and even as I quoted in Acts 24, 14 through 15, uh, Paul was speaking to Israel. The promise that God made to send Christ from Genesis 3, 15 was carried on through because it was all about the seed and it was carried through Abraham in Genesis 12, and then, of course, picked up um, in the uh, in, through the prophets 
and uh, through David, et cetera. And then ultimately we find its fulfillment in the New Testament. Now, so because salvation was um, out from the Jews, John 4 and verse 22, and it was Israel, I mean, the, the Gentiles coming into Israel's salvation. Uh, secondly, um, he spoke of the dead ones, and of course he admitted that and didn't say anything about dead bodies as far as that text was concerned, because Necron doesn't have bodies after the term in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, and then he said the last enemy is death. I'm going to get an opportunity to get to that a little bit later. But the actual text says, since Sam is quoting verb tenses, says the last enemy which is being destroyed is death. I think that's a present uh, passive uh, uh, verb in that particular text. But nevertheless, it was in the process of being destroyed. And uh, he's citing Isaiah 25 and verse 8. And I want to pull some of those things out as well. But let me Try to cover quickly some of the things and then see how much time I have left. All right. He talked about hope as if hope is destroyed when hope is fulfilled. In Proverbs chapter 13 and the verses 20, the text says um, hope deferred. In other words, delayed, not fulfilled, taking a long time, goes past the time that it's promised. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. Now, God has promised to us the tree of life as far as the hope was concerned based on the scriptures. And I'm sure Sam would agree with that in Revelation chapter 21, because that's what Jesus says it was to those who overcame. Well, if they receive it, then apparently it's no good because it has been fulfilled. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, not hope fulfilled. You want to fulfill a promise so that you can enjoy what the promise brings to you. And uh, that should uh, take care of that uh, situation. Furthermore. Uh, he, he brought in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, and he says, all the constituent elements are there. Well, you're right, Sam, I do agree with you. All of the constituent elements are in Acts chapter 17. And do you know what those constituent elements match in Acts 17, uh, 17, 30 and 31? They match Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. Now notice in Matthew 24, 14, he says, and this gospel of the kingdom must be preached as a witness in all the inhabited earth and then to all the nations and then the end will come. Well, let's take a look at Acts chapter 17. Acts 17 was preached by the same apostles as those in Matthew 24. They went to the same inhabited earth, unless they were preaching in two or three different worlds all at the same time, it was the same inhabited earth of uh, that, that they were commanded to go through in Matthew 24. Not only that, their, uh, as I said, their their message was the same. Their um, uh, the scope of their their gospel was the same because he says, "Go teach all the nations," which the Bible affirms they did in Romans sixteen twenty five and twenty six. And so he says to all men everywhere. So what's the difference between all men everywhere and all the nations? He said it was a day that was appointed. Wasn't the day in Matthew 24 appointed day? Yeah, because it talks about that day and hour. That was an appointed day. And by the way, that's also out of the Jewish festal calendar of the Feast of Trumpets, which was called the day that no man knew the day and hour. But it came every single year, just like the Feast of Tabernacles. The Jews understood that idiom when it said uh, no man knows the day and the hour. In addition, um, uh, it was uh, on an appointed day. Well, the time that Jesus spoke about was an appointed day because he said it had to come in that generation. And he said when it occurred, that's when the end would take place. So every element, every constituent element of Matthew 24, 14 is found right there in um, or in Acts 17, 30 and 31 is found right there. And he said that he was about to judge the living and the dead. Wasn't the judgment of Matthew 24 about to occur in the first century generation when those things that Jesus talked about would have come to pass, which they were doing in the book of Acts as we see recorded. So uh, that point gives him nothing. Now he says, um, let's see. Um, that's Acts 17. Oh, he, he said that we want to redefine and refashion uh, resurrection, et cetera. Uh, no, we don't want to refashion it, redefine it. We want to define it as the Bible defined it. Now, let me uh, point to some passages. You see, 1 Corinthians 15 is about the priestly work of Jesus Christ. And the priestly work implies temple typology. 
And um, from that perspective, you have uh, like in Hebrews 7, 11 and 12, that it says uh, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity also a change of the covenant. And when you look at the purpose for which Jesus died, he's operating as high priest because the Bible says in Isaiah 53, Jesus died for our sins. Um, he died to take away our iniquities. He died for our, he, uh, for our justification or, or he died for our offenses as was raised for our justification. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. In Matthew 1, 21, even his name, uh, he came, uh, to, he would save his people from their sins. He came to seek and to save the lost. Uh, his blood was shed for the remission of sins. Paul preached the remission of sins. He was delivered up, as I said, for our offenses. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become not a different physical body, but that we might become the righteousness of God. Christ gave himself for our sins. He purged our sins. And uh, we've talked about the redemption of transgressions in Hebrews 9. He was manifested to take away our sins. He washed us from our sins, etc. And Paul closes 1 Corinthians 15 as he opened it with a reference to sin, because he said that Christ uh, was buried in, in verse 3, that Christ died. He was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And in chapter, or rather in the last verses, it says, uh, the sting of death is sin. And he quotes Isaiah, by the way, the sting of death is sin from, he's quoting Hosea there, but he quotes Isaiah just prior to that, which is all about the death. He says, the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory, who is giving us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, he made a point about the future. And uh, Dunny, if you will, um, let's see, let me get a chart that I want to bring up here. Um, let's see if I can find uh, the chart. No worries, Will, and you just let me know when okay. you're ready to share right. screen. So it's, it's rolling. All right, let's go to, um, Go. just go ahead and roll it. I'll, I'll pick a chart. Okay. And I, I'm almost out of time, man. Ten minutes. This is crazy. <laughs> okay, tell me what's showing on the screen. I can't see. Yeah, it, it, it says resurrection in black and white. All right. So Hold let me let me pick another screen here for the. Um, now, uh, Peter says that Jesus's death and resurrection was not in the same body in which he was put to death. In other words. Uh, he was put, well, when I say that, here's what I mean by that. Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the cross. That's 1 Peter 2, 24. However, when he rose in that same physical body, he did not rise with the sins that he bore when he died on the cross. So Jesus's physical death is about more than just his body coming out of the ground. It was about the removal of sin. That's what he did for man through his physical body. And I think Sam's already affirmed that. Um, in addition, he mentioned Isaiah. Let's see, I got 58 seconds. There's no, just no way. Uh, Isaiah 58. Here is, um, Isaiah 58 mentions the feast. In Isaiah 58 and verse six, God said that he was going to make a feast. The Lord of hosts will make a feast for all people, a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines and on the lees of fat things and marrow of well-refined uh, on the lees. Well, he's referring to the last day, which I know Sam affirms. He said it. The last day, as I pointed out, was the last day of the feast. The feast of harvest, that's Israel's festal calendar. And it was not the last day of time. Ten minutes. <laughs> I'm just going to stop there. This is this is weird. Uh, Thank ten you. minutes. <laughs> yes, appreciate it. Ten minutes flies by. The debate's flying by already. Excellent debate so far. We got a excellent audience. Over a hundred people right now. Really enjoying uh, this so far. So with that, we're now going to hand it over to uh, Dr. Sam Frost for his first ten minute rebuttal. And so, Sam, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Um, well, we, again, we can see um, here where being a former full preterist, um, pretty much along the lines of what Mr. Bill um, is spouting now. Um, I, I, in fact, my book is still published by Don Preston, Exegetical Essays, which reads pretty much like what Mr. Bell is saying. So hearing this again is like, yeah, but you, 
the whole thing is you have to first buy into this whole system to interpret it. And so he says, we're not redefining the resurrection. We're biblically defining it. In other words, for 2000 years, uh, every church scholar, Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, Ethiopian, Japanese, Korean, Asian that has read this passage is simply wrong. Uh, they're all wrong. Uh, nobody has read it this way as Mr. Bill, uh, Mr. Bell is, is reading it. And so there's another thing that you've got to understand is that in order to get what Mr. Bell is saying, you have to buy into the full preterist 70 AD is the endpoint system. And then because that is the end, you can't go beyond that. That's that is the end. So everything has to be defined within that limit. You can't go beyond that limit. And so if you take ordinary terms like Jesus saying in the last day, I will raise up all who are given to me in the last day. OK, am I given to him? No, that that just applies to old covenant Israel being raised out of the corporate body of Adam into the new body of Christ in the last day of 70 AD. And that's it. Well, am I am I drawn? Am I drawn to the Lord? I will raise up all those whom the Lord draws and I will raise him up in the last day. Am I am I included in that? No, no, you're not. Uh, that only applies to those who are the dead, which is corporate old covenant Israel. It does not apply to you. Stop reading that verse like it applies to you because it doesn't. See, you have to buy into this. You, you've got to get into this whole uh, understanding. And then once once you do, as I did, you 70 AD is your end point. And you got to go back and reinterpret. You got to go back and reread the Bible, redefine it so that it fits into the 70 AD thing. You do that after a while, after a few years, you you begin to buy into the mantra. This is how any system operates. You begin to, you just buy into it. It doesn't matter what anybody says to you. You are in the system. That's how you're, that's how you think. That's how you perceive things. So anything that contradicts the system, you have to run it through the system and show where it's all wrong. So debates often end up with just two systems going at it with completely different definitions of terms. But in my case, my definitions of terms are the definitions of terms of the historic Christian faith and the debate that's been going on for 2000 years from all walks of life in all people's languages. It doesn't matter what language, what ethnic origin, it doesn't make any difference because we've all come up with kind of the same thing. And so and we've come up with nothing like 70 AD. That's that's kind of a new thing. What with what Mr. Bell is doing. Uh, everything is fulfilled in 70 AD, all prophecy, resurrection of the dead, the whole the whole nine yards. And so you, obviously, quite obviously, you have to run that back through these traditional passages so that they no longer apply to us. If John 6, and I will draw all men to myself and raise them up in the last day, still applies to me, then 70 AD is not true. It's, it's that simple. If, if 1 Corinthians 15 speaks of and all shall be made alive and all shall be changed and the living will be changed. Even the living will be changed. And so I asked the question uh, of some Christian saint named uh, Apollos walking around in Thessalonica on the ninth of Av when the temple is burning. Was he changed? Did something come over him that the temple was because there's a lot of Christians. They weren't all in Jerusalem. They were all over uh, the Roman world in Galatians or, or uh, Galatia and, and up in Italy, and they were over in Parthia, uh, Babylonia, and even further out. And then you have Ethiopia, Libya, you know, so they're, you know, Christians are all over the place at that time. Around 70, they're, you know, pretty much around out everywhere. Were they all changed? When you ask questions like this, you can't answer it in the normal fashion that a Christian would answer it. You've got to go back into the system and says, well, what kind of change do you mean? See, you have to redefine the word change. You have to redefine the whole thing. Now, I bought into the system and I did redefine the whole thing uh, because AD 70, again, was proof, proof positive for me that AD 70 was the cutoff point. That's the cutoff point. You can't go beyond that. That's the cutoff point. And so obviously you have to go back and redefine everything because if resurrection is not fulfilled, if it's resurrection of the body, if it's resurrection in a transformation, uh, for example, uh, you, you run into numerous problems. So Mr. Bell brings up Acts chapter uh, 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 four. So Jesus has ascended, right? In Acts chapter one, they see him go up. 
it's, you know, they're looking up in the sky. They're 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 doing this because they they're, they follow the action. So he's going up. Why are you men gazing up into the heavens? So he's up there, right? And Peter says, "Heaven must receive him." So because he's not down here, right? He's <laughs> when Peter gave that sermon, Jesus was up there, and heaven must receive him up there. So Colossians chapter three verse one: Set your heart on things above, where he is at the right hand of the Father. Uh, when Stephen sees the vision, he sees Jesus, and uh, behold, I saw heaven opened up, and I saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, which is where he's at when Peter gave that sermon. However, uh, Jesus stated, uh, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Well, wait a minute, is he up there or is he down here with us? Well, both. So what's 70 AD? More of his being with us? Did he, did he come out of heaven? Because that's clearly where he is. But if he's already with us before the end of the age, which he said he was to his apostles, spiritually, by the Holy Spirit, he's with us. But physically, his body, Jesus of Nazareth, is in heaven. See, that explains for that. But the full preterists can't do that. <laughs> they can't do that because if they do, it wrecks the entire system. So they have to have, and I, I want an explanation for it because I've never found one yet. That was one of the reasons why I was like, there, how, do you, how do you account for this? If, if, if clearly in Acts chapter one, Jesus, and they're gazing up and they're look, so you're just following a gazing up. And then Peter gives a sermon uh, that Jesus has been raised and loosed from the pangs of the death. That's resurrection. So the death for three days held him. And on the third day, loosened him from its pangs of the death. He walked out of an empty tomb. That's what that looks like. That's, that's, what a, that's a visible picture. Anybody can understand it. That's the definition of resurrection. And it's the one that Paul starts with in 1 Corinthians 15. He doesn't go into temple typology and it, 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 he goes into Jesus uh, was raised. He died. He was buried. We all understand this, right? Buried. We know what buried means. It, this isn't rocket science. Jesus died. He buried and is raised from the dead. And now he is at the right hand of the father in heaven, whom heaven must receive until all things are restored. Okay. So now we have to define what all things restored means in, because you can't have a future all things restored. You have to have an all things restored in 70 AD, which means post 70 AD that you and I are living in the time of all things being restored. So there is no more death. Well, there still is because you have uh, centers that we have to play church with and evangelize and get people to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which gospel, by the way, is to be proclaimed and then the end. So even in Matthew 24, the function of that verse denotes the purpose of the gospel. The gospel is to be proclaimed as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. That's its function. After the end, why, why preach the gospel? What, what, what point would it have after that? Its function is unto the end. What does it do until the end? It is a testimony. It is a witness to the nations. That's the gospel. That's what it does. And so in William Bell's configuration, we have the gospel and then the end in 70 AD. And then we have more gospel preaching and there is no end. So it, you see how you have to reinvent the whole structure. And even in history, you have to reinvent uh, how we've all understood this, whether we're Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, doesn't make any difference. We all have basically understood this framework, whether all millennial, post millennial, or pre millennial. The same basic substance of the framework is still at work in uh, this larger conversation, but not in the full preterist world. That conversation, there is no conversation because it was all fulfilled and ended in 70 AD. And I'll finish there, which means that I'm finished. I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Sam Frost for that 10 minute rebuttal. Gentlemen, that concludes the first round of rebuttals. That was 10 minutes. And we're now moving into the second round of rebuttals. This time it is five minutes. And so this will be a speed round, I am sure. Uh, William Bell, whenever you're ready, just and let William me know. Bright, there's just not enough time. To 
<laughs> right. Yeah. I think we need about a 15 hour debate oh, versus yeah, yeah. a three hour debate. So you, you need several nights for, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. We need a whole conference gentlemen, but you're both doing a fantastic job and William, you got five minutes. Go okay. ahead. I didn't even know how you could hear me because my, my mic was, but anyway, uh, <laughs> let me go very quickly. Sam was talking about how we are changed. If you go to second Corinthians chapter three, and the verse is 18, the Bible talks about a change that was taking place from glory to glory. Within that context, he called it a ministration of death um, that um, they were under, which was which was dealing with the letter or the, the old covenant. He says, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away at, at that time. But he says, how will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that is excelling. Now watch, for in what is passing away, was if what was passing away is glorious, what is remaining is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, and there's only one hope in the Bible. So that hope was the transformation out of the old covenant administration of death into the new covenant ministration of life, which was the spirit, and that was resurrection. As the Bible says, the veil is taken away when they turn to the Lord. Now watch at verse 18, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. From what? From that exile. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, are being changed from glory uh, into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. Now that was taking place through the spirit. Sam uh, brought up, how is Jesus with us? First of all, again, the hope in Colossians 1 27 says the hope was Christ in you, the hope of glory. I like to see how Sam can show us that the physical body of Jesus is inside all of us as our hope or will be in all of our physical bodies for our hope. No, that's not what that means. That's just like uh, Luke 17, 20, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. That's talking about Christ dwelling in us through righteousness because David said, I will, uh, when I awake, I will see your face in righteousness, Psalm 17 and 15. And that's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 34 says, awake to righteousness and do not sin for some have not the knowledge of God. So resurrection was all about rising to righteousness. That's Galatians 3.21. If there had been a law which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Righteousness and life are interchanged. And Paul said in Galatians 5 and 5, for we through the spirit do wait for the hope of righteousness. Well, that's in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, he also um, tried to say that, well, the purpose of the gospel ends. However, that's not what the Bible teaches, because in the same book, the scripture says, heaven and earth would pass away, but my word will not pass away. And that's a quote from Isaiah 51, I think verses six and seven and eight, et cetera, where he says, my salvation will not be abolished. My righteousness will be forever. And then when we look in Isaiah uh, six, and I didn't even turn my timer on, so I don't know how much time I have. Um, Isaiah chapter 66. William, you have exactly two minutes. Two minutes, thank you. In Isaiah 66, the scripture says, after this judgment that came, uh, it says um, that he was going to set a sign among them and those among those who escape will send to the nations to Tarshish and Paul and Lud, who draw the bow and Tubal and Javan to the coastlands afar off who have not heard my fame nor seen my glory and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Then they shall bring all your brethren for an offering to the Lord out of the, all the nations on horses and chariots and litters and mules and camels to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. And I will also take some of them for priests and Levites, says the Lord. For as the new heavens and new earth, uh, which I will make remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. They didn't end. Time didn't end after that. Watch. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh. What are they doing uh, with flesh here in the new heaven, the new earth? And But watch. All flesh shall come to worship me uh, before me, says the Lord, and they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. He's not talking about the end of the world. He's talking about the end of that old covenant system. They're now in the new heavens and new earth. Let's see. Uh, how much time, uh, Dunny? You've got 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. 
Sam went to Revelation 20 in a previous talk to talk about the lake of fire and everything ending. But what he didn't do was tell you that in Revelation 19, 1 and 2, that judgment and salvation comes at the destruction of Mystery Babylon, which is Jerusalem, Revelation 11, 8, where the city of our Lord was crucified. And the marriage follows that judgment upon Mystery Babylon. That Those were the ones who killed the saints and the prophets. Well, the marriage in Revelation 20, I mean, 21, comes after chapter 20. That means it's in harmony and coincides with Revelation 19. So whatever Sam is saying has to take place at the time of the wedding, and the wedding follows the fall of Jerusalem, Mystery Babylon, in Revelation 19, and that's Matthew 24, Matthew 22, Ephesians 5 and 6, and it all happened uh, in 70 AD, but that wasn't the end because the kingdom of God continues through the age. Thank you. Okay, William, thank you for that fast round of uh, rebuttal. Five minutes does fly by. Uh, to be equally timed, Sam will give you uh, the exact same amount of time, but five and a half minutes, I understand these rebuttals do fly by. So Sam, we're going to hand you the floor now for the second rebuttal, and this time uh, roughly five minutes. So whenever you're ready, go ahead. Um, well, here was in my thinking. So in Second Corinthians chapter three, where Paul talks about the ministration of the death, he, so he uses that phrase. And you think that uh, while you're in the system of full preterism, you know, that that's the administration, uh, but it's not the only administration. But Paul just mentions that your covenant is an administration of the death. He doesn't use the word only. The reason why I say that is because the same the death that William would insist upon came through the man, Adam, who did not have the old covenant. Uh, Noah didn't have the old covenant. Abel didn't have the old covenant. Um, none of them had the old covenant prior to Moses. In fact, uh, Paul gives that line from Adam to Moses, which is where uh, scholars realize that in that primeval history, Genesis 1 through 11, that's where Paul's hanging out a lot because in a lot of Jewish literature in the first century, they were not hanging out there. Paul hangs out there. He shifts the story back before Israel. He shifts the story back before the old covenant. Death is already reigning. Before the administration of the death, death is already ruling and reigning. Well, where did that come from? Well, it didn't come from an old covenant. It came through the transgression of Adam. And we know what that is because it's defined in the text. To dust you are, to dust you shall return. Which, by the way, the imagery in Daniel 12, 2 is, you will rise from the dust of the earth. There's no mistake going on there. You can read Psalm 90, which mentions dust of the earth. Man shall, God has ordained that we shall return to the dust of the earth. In fact, in that uh, Psalm 90, which is a commentary of Moses um, on Genesis, because he's using the Genesis language, and I happen to believe Moses wrote this Psalm. So in that Psalm, uh, a, a Psalm of Moses, he says, you turn men back to dust, saying, return to the dust. Now, who does this? God does. God returns men back to the dust saying, return to the dust, O sons of men. That's human beings, by the way, which Jesus is a son of man, a human being. A human being has a body. And it says here, uh, return to the dust, O sons of men. And then he continues on. So what does he mean by this returning to the dust and all of this? You have set our iniquities before you. Our secret sins are hidden in your presence. Our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with the moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80. Um, what's he talking about here? Right. Growing old and dying, returning to the dust. It, it's a no-brainer. Again, it, the Bible with the law of parsimony, the Bible is written to ordinary people who ordinarily understand these ordinary things that are brought up. And ordinary, living to 70 or 80 that means death. And then we, what? Return to the dust. Well, where did that come from? And Paul specifically refers to that as in Romans 5, 12, the death did enter in through the sin, through the transgression of Adam. Not Moses, not the law that was given to Israel much later, but with Adam. And it's the death that is over all the nations, because Paul says everybody dies. And I don't know of anybody that hasn't or isn't. 
And that entered in through Adam because he's cut off from the tree of immortality. By which if he would have eaten of that, he would have lived forever. But he's cut off from that tree and he has no access to it. And what happens to him? He dies. Simple. What's resurrection from the dust? Well, you got to look to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the definition of that. Because Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and still is raised. The human being, Jesus of Nazareth, born of a woman, was physically raised from the dead by the power of God, walked on this earth, and then he ascended to heaven at the right hand of God, wherein he now is. But because of his unity with the Son of God, the Logos, the eternal one person, two natures, Again, Christianity has worked this theology out with painstaking detail. Uh, took 200 years painstaking detail to work out the mystery of how can Christ be in heaven on one hand and not present with us, and how can he be present with us on the other hand in spirit because he's the God-man. He's truly God. He's truly man. See, that all of this works out in the theology of Paul, which is where they were work the the theologians were working out their theology, reading Paul. How can Jesus be with us to the end of the age? And yet at the same time, he's also at heaven at the right hand of God. How is that possible? Well, the God seconds. man explains that. And so that's it. Sam, thank you very Let's much for that five minute rebuttal. Mm -hmm. Uh gentlemen, we have now concluded the opening statements and our two uninterrupted rebuttal rounds. And so fantastic debate so far, lots of great feedback from the audience and just about enough audience questions to keep us busy until same time tomorrow night. So with that, we're moving into our cross-examination period, everybody's favorite parts, uh, part of these awesome debates. And so our first cross-exam though will be 25 minutes. So in total, we have 50 minutes on the clock. But the first 25 minutes will be the affirmative cross-examining the negative. And therefore, uh, William, whenever you're ready, you get the first 25 minutes to lead the way in questions. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, thank you. Let, hold on a second. Can you stop the clock? Just a second. Or yeah, yeah, no worries. You just or let me know when you're ready. All right. So this is 25 minutes, then 25 minutes, right? That's right. Yeah. 25 right. minutes each to basically yeah, yeah, yeah. lead the way in questions. Okay. I am ready. All right. The first question I would like to ask uh, Sam in 1 Corinthians 15, when the scripture says that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was he dying as our high priest offering himself up for sins of man, or did that have nothing to do with the priesthood whatsoever? I won't say it had nothing to do with the priesthood whatsoever. Hebrews brings that up, but uh, Paul doesn't bring it up there. So that's, that's not his point. He could have brought it up, but he just doesn't. So uh, there's many aspects in which you would agree in facets and aspects and attributes of Jesus that could be brought up king, priest, judge, lawgiver. He's all of these things. Um, but when you're in a particular context to bring up a particular point about a facet of who Jesus is, uh, which Paul doesn't bring up the high priestly stuff. He's not bringing up any of that kind of stuff, whatever. What he is bringing up is that uh, here's a guy that died, was buried in uh, the perfect tense, has been raised, is raised. The King James translates it, is risen. So they use a present is uh, the copy of uh, is risen. So he still is risen. That's the whole, that's the force of the point that's being made there. Okay. And so, oh, sorry. Yeah. Nope. You're good. Okay. So you don't see anything in first Corinthians 15 that relates to priesthood, not even Psalm 110. I, again, uh, staying with the context and the focus, there are many aspects and things that can be brought up about Psalm 110. There are many aspects that can be brought up based on one particular point that you're making. But we don't want to make the mistake where we're bringing in all these scriptures all over the place in, into a context that is specifically dealing as it states. How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? That's what he's talking about. 
and we 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 encounter that in Acts 17. We I know Greek literature at the time. They they would never have gone for it something like a dead body raising up and ascending into heaven. That's that's just very foreign to their to their not all of them, but those that were philosophers, thinkers, Stoics, Epicureans. Uh, they just didn't think in those those kind. Why would you want a body? Why would why would Jesus want a body to go to heaven? What whole point would that just serves no point? But for Paul, it it is the point. That is the point. Okay. Um... Do you believe that 1 Corinthians 15 is parallel to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? I think there are some similarities that are going on there, not entirely. Uh, again, there are many aspects and facets that are going on. So you, you have to stay within, like if I'm writing a letter, um, I might say something to my daughter in an email or something like that, but she's not going to attach everything that it is that I mean by a particular term because I'm focusing in on one aspect of it. We have to be careful with that in exegesis so that we don't uh, sound like a Jack Van Impey or something, just flinging texts and verses all over the place. We have to look at each and every single verse in its original context. And then if we can expand it out from there, then we can do that. And that's a general rule that I accept. Well, I'm, I'm trying to give you a specific verse. In 2 Corinthians 5, when he says, for if our earthly house, this tabernacle were destroyed, we have a building of God eternal in the heavens, yeah. a house not made with hands. Now, can you, um, would you agree that that text talks about houses and would you show where the scripture has ever used the physical body to speak of a house not made with hands? Well, you're picking a notoriously difficult passage in uh, the commentaries, many of which you see here behind me, dealing with Second Corinthians 5 and what it is that he's doing there. I'm of the persuasion uh, that Paul is not comparing body with body. Uh, rather, he's computing uh, our jars of clay, our current dwelling place or a tent. Um, and when that tent is dissolved, we enter into the building. And it's in the Greek, it's the building of God. Now, that image of the building of God in heaven, that's that's Old Testament. God dwells in his building in his temple in heaven. All of that. So that's where we enter. He's, our body doesn't enter. And he's not saying that the building of God is God's body, God doesn't have a body. And so here, uh, Paul is saying that we leave this body, this temple, this tent, and we enter into heaven in God's building, dwelling in God's temple, dwelling in God's house. And so he's not comparing body with body. He's, com he's comparing dwelling with dwelling. And so I leave this dwelling, and then I go into the dwelling of God in heaven. And then he ends that in verse 10 with, but we shall all stand before the throne of Christ and we shall be all judged. So he's adding and bringing in this idea of resurrection of the dead, which is what he says in 1 Corinthians 15. So I'm of the persuasion that he's speaking here of an intermediate state. And I'm, I'm in pretty good company there as far as uh, the interpreters and exegetes and scholars go. Well, uh, the text says, if the earthly house, this tabernacle were destroyed, we have mm -hmm. a building of God. Now, um, we have. Can you, give us, can you give the first reference to uh, anything not made with hands in Scripture and tell us what that is? Well, the temple is described as a building not made with hands. That's stated in Hebrews. Uh, okay. Solomon realizes that this temple is not a place for you to dwell. You fill the whole heavens and the whole earth. How could I build a house for you to dwell in? It's it's an absurd idea that you dwell in this high, in this house. But nonetheless, you told me to build it, and so I will build it. Is that uh, the so first reference you can find in Scripture? The reference is not made with hands is uh, explicitly found, I think, in Hebrews, where it refers to not made with hands. Okay, um, I'll, I'll take that for the moment. In Daniel 2, 34, and also 44 and 45, when Daniel saw the stone cut out of the mountain without hands, yeah. what is he referring to there? Well, he's referring to the stone. He saw a stone falling out of heaven. And so he saw a stone not cut with hands. But here again, see what you're doing? You see a little phrase, not with hand, and then you want to take that everywhere else. In Daniel's context, how do you know that that's what Paul has in reference? You're, you're well, making it, these connections it, because based upon, and that's a that's a that's a word fallacy to do that. Just because one word occurs over here, it must mean this over here. You, you can't. You, scholars abhor that kind of stuff because what Paul's talking about in the context of Paul is Paul thinking about Daniel two twenty two. Is that, or 42? Is that what Paul has in mind when he uses that phrase? He's like, well, oh, I, Daniel. No, I, how do you know that? 
I think he would be since he's dealing with the time of the end. I, and, I don't know. I'm not going to base a dogma off of it, though. And, and, and first Corinthians 15. Well, that's you, and, and this is me. Uh, the very text that you cited in Hebrews chapter 12, um, let, me, let me go there for a moment. Since you have agreed that he talks about the house not made with hands there, let's see what he might be talking about. Um, starting well, a rock in, not made without hands, not a house. I don't know how me? you get rock from house. No, no, no. I'm going into Hebrews 12 at this point. Okay. Okay. And um, there, there are several references to what's not made with hands in the book of Hebrews. You know, if you start with Hebrews chapter eight and verse two, mm -hmm. it says he's a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. So that's still tit, that's still house of God, which the Lord erected and not man. And then in mm -hmm. chapter nine, he says, Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is not of this creation, meaning not of the old uh, covenant Absolutely. creation. Absolutely. And then in chapter 12, when he's making this discussion, uh, he's he's seeing this contrast between the two covenants, between uh, Hebrews 12, 18, beginning that they had not come to, but they had come to Mount Zion. And I think you would agree that Mount Zion is a house of God, according to Isaiah chapter two and two. And uh, but not then, a body. Well, in first Timothy wow. chapter. Hold on a second. First Timothy chapter three, verse 15 says, but if I am delayed that I may know how I ought to uh, how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Now, is the church a body or not? See here. No, 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 no. I just asked you a question, Sam. Is the church yeah, in, a, in a certain okay. metaphorical context? Uh, all right, all that's that's on a very often used metaphor of the student body or body politic. Greeks were using this all over the place. But uh, again, to take that reference and to cram it into every single other reference is not good. All right, let me see if this helps you a little bit. In John chapter two, Jesus said, uh, "Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up." And mm -hmm. Uh, the Jews said, well, 40 and six years was this temple in building. And uh, how are you going to raise it up in three days? And then after he rose from the dead, the disciples understood that he spoke of the temple of his body. So my question is, and and uh, uh, D.A. Carson in his book, he's got it on the floor somewhere, I can't remember the name of it, The Church and uh, the Church's Mission or something. Uh, and sorry, uh, if he's, if this gets back to him, I don't mean to butcher up the title of his book, but you know what I'm talking about. The Church and the Temple and the, the church mission yeah. in the temple of God, something to that effect. But anyway, he says that uh, there's a double entendre there and that when Jesus is speaking about that, he's not simply speaking of his body as far as his physical body, but he's also speaking about the temple that he would raise up. And the Jews in Mark 14 and verse 58 had a, um, uh, they when they came as false witnesses, they said, we heard this, we heard him say that uh, destroy you know, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will raise it up. And, uh, of course, uh, a house not made with hands. Well, they didn't quite understand him and uh, misrepresented what he said. But here's the point. In Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, the scripture talks about the foundation stone that was laid, which comes from Isaiah 28, 16, etc., that says there's no other found, you know, neither is there uh, salvation any other, for there's no other foundation uh, I'm getting two scriptures confused here, trying to go fast. But anyway, you understand the scripture. Neither is there yeah, salvation yeah, yeah. any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we may be saved. And he says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now, would you agree that that is not Jesus' physical body, but yet it is a temple that began in his death and resurrection? I'm going to side with John in here and where John says he was talking about his body. Okay, so, so you're going to disagree again, with D.A. You got, no, hold on a I'm, second. Agreeing, <laughs> I'm agreeing with what John says. And even if there's a double entendre, the way that double entendres work is a connotation denotation. You have to have a denotation, an actuality, in order to have a double entendre or a metaphor. You must have a reality of a basis. I'm not denying the resurrection of Jesus' body. So Jesus explicitly states that his body is the temple that will be raised in three days. Now, if you want to argue that the church was raised in three days, well, didn't he start the church through that process? Well, you know, when you go to John, for example, hold on, a, hold on a, a second. In John um, 1 and verse 14, the text says, and the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory was the only begotten of the Father, full of God, grace and truth. Now, is that a reference to Jesus being the embodiment of the temple of God? Because later on in the book of Revelation, when it says, and I saw no temple in it, 
for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Now, so then would you say that God and Christ are the temple? Yes or no? He actually uses the metaphor in Ezekiel where he says, I was their sanctuary. That's in Ezekiel. I will be exactly. your sanctuary. So does God act as the holy, holy and, and temple and all of these images get conflated? But what happens is with what you're doing is conflating them all together into this one big giant thing so that you can have the 70 AD thing going on. No, and no. The fact <laughs> of the matter is, is that's not that's not how they're using that. That's not how Paul is using it. Well, it's, let's it's not how Jesus is using it. Let's see. In First Peter chapter two, which, by the way, he's quoting from Hosea one, Hosea, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the text in Hosea one and chapter two in this context. But he says in verse five, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through yeah. Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in scripture. Now, this is the same text. Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and who believes on him will not uh, by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the bills rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now, that text is stated in Matthew chapter 21. It's stated in Isaiah 28, 16, where he says that's where death was going to be destroyed. I think he uses the death in that text and um, the um, uh, their agreement with with Sheol, etc. So from that text, do you see this as Jesus's physical body? in first peter 2. absolutely so first peter 2 is the physical body of christ in this particular I, text well i know that you deny that jesus still has an actual body but that's, that's no 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 i'm, I'm not denying that i'm asking I, i'm well I, I don't believe that he has a body in heaven physical right. body from that perspective right. but what i'm saying is well there goes the temple because this temple is the body so no 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 uh, <laughs> the body is the body of christ and I don't think you believe that the that the church, which is the spiritual body of Christ, is literally his physical body, unless you're looking at the people who are a part of it as that physical body. At any rate, when Paul said that the foundation was laid and that no man, other man could lay than that which is Jesus Christ, and he wrote to the church and says, you are God's temple, you are God's building, and you are the temple of God, was he literally talking about Jesus's physical body in that context? Again, um, okay. what you're doing is because John says that Jesus is referring to his body. So what body when John, when you the first passage you brought up, what's he what's John referring to that's raised? What was raised on the third day, William? The church? It was Jesus in the new covenant. You no. have you can ask that question right. later you can ask me that question later this is this is my time to ask you questions now you you insinuated that i had a different death from um for for genesis and second corinthians that's not true in my first affirmative i affirm the death of romans chapter 5 was the death of adam so let me put it on record and, and make it clear here uh once again in romans chapter 5 uh, he says, therefore, justice through one man sin into the world and death through sin. And thus the death spread to all men because all sin and nevertheless, the death reigned from Adam to Moses. Now, the death that he's talking about is the very death of Adam that you just agreed to. And then in verse 19, he says for uh, verse 20, more over the law entered that the offense might abound. Now, what offense was that that abounded when the law entered? Wasn't that the offense of Adam? It's the offense of sin. That came through whom? Sin entered in through Adam. Okay, therefore, so then it's there, the, therefore all, not just Adam. All doesn't sin. doesn't that cover your all from Adam to Moses, and thus Absolutely. it's that That's Paul's point. Yeah. Okay, so it's the sin from Adam to Moses. So I'm not making some dichotomy between two different kinds of the sin in the context. Now, does Paul follow that the sin motif through um, chapter six? Oh, yeah, he calls it a power, exousia. Okay, it's, it's, whatever, it's it's still the sin. If it's raining over you, it's a power, most surely. Yeah, and, so, and so what he says then, in because uh, I want to address a couple of things. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in the sin that mm -hmm. the grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to what? To 
the sin live any longer in it. So we're still talking about the sin, correct? Then he says, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now, if you're baptized into his death and they die with him, then what death is Jesus dying in this context? It's it's the death that entered in through Adam, which is returning to the dust. And de Jesus was raised from the dust. He left the empty tomb of which the death held the pangs of the death loosened him from Acts chapter two, which I quoted. It's, there's not multiple deaths going on. It's the death all the way through scriptures, all the way through. The, no, the, the text the says, death. are we the still death. are we still under the covenant of Moses? I don't have to be under the covenant of Moses for the death he, to reign. He said the death reigned from Adam to Moses. He didn't say it reigned from Adam to Moses and thereafter. So it reigned before Moses ever came along. Of course. He says it reigned from Adam. Wasn't Adam so before Moses? So death, the reign of death doesn't need Moses. Moses exacerbated the reign of death. Yeah. That's right. what the that's what the text says. But anyway, let me let me continue. Let me continue. Now, in verse four, he says, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, the word should there is the aorist subjunctive. We're dealing with a resurrection text. We're talking about Jesus Christ who died. This is Jesus dying. As you understand him, physically dying, that's how I understand him. But it says that when they were baptized, um, they were raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. And he says they should walk in newness of life. Now, the word should is an error subjunctive, which means that the action of walking with him from the error's point of view has begun. But the subjunctive aspect of it, which is the probability of a future action, has not been yet completed. That's uh, Aris doesn't. It, the word "should" is is uh, okay. Um, is perfectly translated. It's good. There's no there's no uh, temporal elements that are going on there. With Aris. well, okay, it's you the focus is on action, not time. You you say that it's not. I think James D G Dunn would disagree with you, as well as um, who wrote that uh, new international Gordon Fee would disagree with you because they argue for the Aris subjunctive, and and that's fine. That's fine. Uh, whichever grammar you have, but the, the point them. is now watch, I have several too, and I'm, I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm not trying to be one. I do read a little bit. However, in, um, because he says that they should walk in newness of life. Now, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly also we shall be now is shall here a real future or no. I think it is a future. Yeah. It's a real future. Right. Yeah. So so what Paul does in these texts, particularly dealing with resurrection, he will use the error subjunctive on the one hand and the, to indicate that mm -hmm. the process is underway. And then he will sort of undergird that with a real future. Let me give you another example real quick. If we go to Romans chapter 13, which is definitely a, um, a um, text on the resurrection, at least from my point of view, Paul says in verse 11, and do this knowing the appointed time, there's the word kairos, that it is the hour to awake mm -hmm. out of sleep. Now, I think that's a quote from Daniel chapter 12, personally. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. So the night there being the darkness, a euphemism for, for death, excuse me, the day has drawn near or is at hand. Now, notice that he says, therefore, let us cast off. Now, the, the phrase... Oh, the word for cast off is error subjunctive. Mm -hmm. It means that they have already begun casting off the darkness. Sure. But at the same time, the darkness is not fully cast off. Right. Right. So what he's and, and this darkness that they had begun casting off was not their physical body. Oh, but darkness. No one, but, no one says that it is. OK. But what I'm saying is this is a resurrection text. And then he says, and let us put on the armor of light. In Acts 26, 22, and 23, Paul said that his purpose was to turn them from darkness to light. And he's using that in a resurrection context. So darkness, and just for example, one other uh, point I want to make on this. In um, Back to the text in Hosea. When Hosea says, you are not my people, he's saying they've been cut off. 
-hmm. They're sent off into exile, into uh, Syrian captivity. But then he says the time will come when he will gather together Judah and Israel. And when he does that, he says, there it should be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. So there's a contrast then between being cut off or dead in sin and then being called the sons of the living God. Now, here's what Peter says about that in First Peter. Peter says when that happens, they are turning from darkness to light because Christ is light and Christ is the resurrection. Therefore, to turn to Christ is to turn to resurrection, to turn to light. So the dichotomy between darkness and light is not a physical body versus a nut versus a dead physical body versus a living physical body. The darkness is uh, sin, just like death reigning from Adam to Moses, turning to righteousness. Do you agree with that? I don't think it's talking about bodies there at all. Okay, I, I agree. So that's the same text, however. Oh, resurrection. You, you say you don't think he's talking about resurrection at all? No. There, there was no resurrection in Hosea one, you which you. The, Hold on, hold on. Is the Lord of my path. The, the Lord lights my path. He's not saying the Lord resurrects my path. I'm walking in resurrection. That's all right. Did you not Lord. quote in Romans chapter eight that Paul was citing in in Romans nine? Uh, that Paul was citing Hosea 1, mm -hmm. and you said that that was the manifestation of the sons of God, and it was the redemption of the body. Sure, and that hasn't happened yet. Okay, well, you said it hasn't happened, yeah. but but my point is you agree that that's it. Well, Paul is citing Romans uh, in, in uh, Romans 9, verse mm -hmm. 25 and 26 from Hosea 1, using right. the very text from Hosea that you just said was a resurrection out of sin death or, or was there being dead in sin and then be, being made alive and that was not yeah. physical resurrection. Now he does the same thing in Hosea chapter five and six when Israel go off into sin, God says, I will not uh, help them until they acknowledge their offense and on the third day I will raise them up. That is first Corinthians 15. So he's drawing from that text on sin death. And then in Revelation, uh, excuse me, in Hosea 13, 14, uh, starting with Hosea 13, one, he says that Israel, when they were, um, um, uh, humble, et cetera. Um, I can't even think of the text. I'm trying to go so fast here because I know my time is running out. But anyway, you get the idea. And then after they had sinned with Baal worship, they sinned more and more. So they were still alive. They sinned. They were going into captivity. God said he was their only um, uh, um, deliverance or salvation, their only king. But he says, after this birth pangs, which we find in Matthew 24 and Romans 8, he says, I'm going to deliver them from the power of the grave. And that's what Paul quotes at the end of 1 Corinthians 15. So he's got an inclusio there dealing with sin on both ends and even all in between uh, using those references of Israel's and, national and, exile. Well, I was just going to say, if you could wrap up those thoughts with a question and then we'll give Sam the final word as we are almost at 25. Minutes. Okay, so do you agree that in all three of those references in Hosea, one, two, I said three, but it's four, uh, uh, five, excuse me, six and um, 13 are all references to the same nature of exile and death re resulting from sin that Paul uses in his eschatological paradigm. No, they're in, they're in reference to the resurrection of the dead. That's the, the promises are awaiting the resurrection of the dead. That's, that, that, that's how Paul uses Hosea when he quotes it in 1 Corinthians 15. It's obviously a resurrection passage. And he conflates it with Isaiah 25, which is also a resurrection passage, of which the veil that covers over all the nations, not just Israel. Moab was not a part of Israel. And, and Moab is exclusively mentioned in Isaiah 25, 8, when the death will be swallowed up in victory. All the nations, not just Israel. Moab was in Adam, wasn't he? And we just covered that in Romans 5. Adam is not Israel. Ag agreed. Yeah. So it doesn't apply so that, just to Israel. And my point is, Moab would have been a son of Adam and the death reigned from Adam to Moses. I'm a son of Adam. Okay. Gentlemen, another fast paced round this yeah. time, 25 minutes. Uh, you're both doing a great job and we've still got the next round of 25 minutes. This time it'll be uh, Sam. You will be leading the way for this 25 minute period. So again, the floor is yours, gentlemen. Go ahead. So um, just. Um, Noting that in, in these two exchanges of, of responses or cross-examination, uh, how um, different 
completely different um what i'm saying and and what william bell and that's kind of the only point i i want folks to to realize is that we are not talking about the same thing we're not talking about this our, our definitions are radically different uh from each other and so that that's that's the whole issue there so uh, for me when paul talks about the death that came through the adam uh that, that came through adam uh and i read psalm 90 a psalm of moses who wrote genesis and he uses the phrase return to the dust william what does return to the dust mean to you okay um of course, we can always look at return to the dust from a physical point of view, but in the term of uh, in as it regards to uh, the death of Adam, as we've just been discussing and the nations who are in exile, it refers to um, that very thing in exile. Let me give you a couple of scriptures here in Isaiah 41. The text says, and this is referring to Babylon, come, uh, come down and sit in the dust. O virgin daughter of Babylon. Well, let me. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I have some time here, so I don't want to give you no, all. No, but I didn't, I didn't interrupt you. Well, I did a little bit, but at least I did give you time to speak until you started minutes. asking me questions. So at least let me respond. Okay. I, I'm, okay. So he says, O virgin daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground without a throne. O daughter of Chaldeans, for you shall no more be called tender and delicate, take the millstones, etc. So here is Babylon being destroyed. Their power and their reign is being destroyed. So they're sitting in the dust. Same thing in Isaiah 52, where you have a reference to Jerusalem. And this is all about their uh, salvation. This is focusing down to the gospel. But he says, awake, awake. It's a resurrection motif. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised, the unclean shall no longer come to you. Shake yourself from the dust. Now, I don't think the whole of Israel was lying around waddling in the dust. That's a term for being under the oppression of a foreign ruler. Then even in the text that you've cited several times tonight, which is Isaiah 25, uh, talking about death, the text says, okay. um, with Moab, this is the last point, it says... Um, the fortress of the high fort of your walls, he will bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, down to the dust. That's not a reference to their physical death. Some of them okay. might have died in the judgment, but that's a reference to their losing their power and no longer reigning. Okay, but well, so in Psalm 90, um, in, in the context where he's uh, saying, you return to the dust, O sons of men, and then he says, uh, you sweep men away in the sleep of death, and then uh, literally, he talks about 70 to 80 years of living. And you still see that as metaphorical? In Psalm 90, uh, give me the exact text that you're looking at. Well, the, exact the, verse. Whole, the whole psalm is about death. Oh, well, the whole I see this psalm, and I agree with you that this is a psalm that was written by Moses. Mm -hmm. It is written concerning the time of God's wrath upon Israel on, in, in, the, in the Exodus. Uh, during the time of the Exodus. Well, you can laugh, Sam, but here's the point. That wrath that was spoken of in the the um, in the Exodus was for 40 years. That's why he uses all these short time frames for this particular text. And then when you go to Hebrews chapter uh chapter 3, he mentions the time of the wrath. In Hebrews 3, he says, therefore, verse seven, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my way. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That's the period of that wrath. It was a 40 year period and it forms a type of the wrath in the New Testament. Right. And this is a, an example, again, of how everything is to be read in light of Israel only in the covenant. And that's it. And nothing else appeals to anything else. So even a simple psalm, which every commentary in the world that I've ever read on the psalms, and I've read quite a bit of them on Psalm, one, on psalm 90, uh, everybody seems to know what he's talking about there, William, except you. <laughs> I mean, so all I want, my, my point, my point here is, the disconnect between what everybody else is saying over here and what the full preterist must say because they are stuck by the time of 70 AD to redefine 
what everybody else is talking about over here. You have to do this to get into the system. I know all too well because that's exactly what I did when I got into the system. I realized what I was doing and I did it because I could not get away from the 70 AD endpoint. And because that forced, it forced me to go back into and reread these passages. So I can't read Psalm 90 anymore in the normal fashion that any Jew, Gentile, whoever's reading it understands what it means is the limit of life. And then we die. And everybody understands what that means. And except the full preterist. They can't have physical, biological death in any way, shape or form being part of the curse that came through Adam because that right there immediately brings you into physical resurrection, which by the way, Jesus demonstrates. He demonstrates it, which is what Paul starts his argument off with. It would be far more better had Jesus walked, uh, not walked out of the tomb, but just simply appeared to his disciples and then they, Mary said, hey, your body's still in the tomb. What are you doing over here? And Jesus says, that's not the nature of resurrection, Mary. That would have solved everything. Everything would have been solved. No brainer. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus physically died. He physically was buried in a tomb for three days. And he physically came out of the tomb raised in power. He was sown without honor. He was raised with honor and glory. Hebrews 2 says this. It says it. He's raised crowned with glory and honor. We at this present time do not see all things subjected to our feet, but we do see Jesus to whom all things have been subjected to, which gets back to my opening statement about the death. And that's why I want to focus on the death. So the death that came through the man, Adam, is the death that reigns from Moses, uh, Adam to Moses. So is the old covenant required for the death to reign? That's my, a yes or no, we'll work on that one. The old covenant was not required for death to reign okay. because the death was reigning before the old covenant was given. So the, for the death to reign does not require the old covenant. It does not require the old covenant from the text right. that was mentioned because in that text, he already told you that death was reigning already before right. the old covenant was given and that the death reigned from, from Adam to Moses. It doesn't yeah. say that death reigns from Adam to Moses. That means that we now have a the power of grace that reigns over death. Well... If that's the case, and you're stating in Romans chapter 6, where he states at the very end of his whole conclusion, so that just as sin reigned in the death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life. That sounds to me right there that sin is reigning. Sin reigns in the death. That's, that's the whole function and purpose of the sin and the death. So if the sin reigns in the death, these are principalities and powers. And then Paul continues to go on and talks about this power of sin that comes in. We see it in Genesis chapter four, where the sin desires you, but you must master it. What, what, what sin? Sin desires Cain? What, what is sin of personifying power? What's going on? So Paul talks about this sin. It's no longer I that do it, but it's the sin. Well, what is that? Well, he calls it a power. It's, it rules and it reigns. When the law says don't covenant, covenant, Sin comes along and says, covet, covet. When it says, don't steal, sin comes along in our minds and says, steal, take that. That's That belongs to you. So whenever the law comes along, sin comes along, don't touch the wet paint. I tell my sons all the time, don't touch that. And what do they do? They touch it. It's instinctive. Why is that? Because the sin does what it is that it does. Whenever it hears, do not handle, do not touch, do not touch. What do we do? The opposite. We're... <laughs> And again, everybody understands this. I, I can relate this to my children. Don't touch the wet paint. Don't touch the grass. Put your seatbelt on. And what do they don't do? They touch the grass. They touch the wet paint and they don't wear their seatbelts. <laughs> Why? Paul explains it because the sin, it's, it's, there's a principality at work in our flesh that wars against our flesh. 
And so I can relate to that. I, I, I don't, I totally relate to that. And then what Paul is saying is that the law is given to Moses, but clearly death is reigning before Adam to Moses. So the administration of the covenant of Moses is not required for the death to reign and the sin to reign in the death. He, he states this quite plainly. If that's the case, and if God sets aside the old covenant, does that mean he, he's also set aside the death? Well, if that's the case, when is the death, as I opened up with, when is the death thrown into the lake of fire? Or is the death that is thrown into the lake of fire not the same the death in Revelation 21, where there will be no more the death? So what is this? And I, let me ask you this. Is the death in Revelation 21.4 the same as the death that's thrown into the lake of fire in Revelation 20.15? My answer is yes, because yeah. it in the um, in the however, the reigning in Revelation 21 is in the New Jerusalem. It's in the kingdom. So that's where there is no more death. That's what the text says. John says, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle. So that's temple typology of God is with them, uh, with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more the death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things that passed away. Now, the death in this text is no more physical than the sorrow and the crying. People still cry, they still die physically. When Jesus said in John 8, uh, if a man keep my word, he shall never see death. It was the Jews who didn't believe that came back and said, now we know you got a devil because Abraham is dead and the prophet. See, they went straight back to physical death, which is where the futurists go, which is where the people who believe that it's all about physical death. That's what they talked about. Jesus wasn't yeah. discussing that. So he said in John 11, he who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And, and Martha yeah. said, yeah, I believe that. So that's the difference between the two. But that's in him because he is the resurrection. And one last thing, let me say this. I'll make it quick. I want to reiterate because you brought this up again. I pointed out that in Revelation 18, 20 and 24, yeah. the harlot there was the one who murdered the apostles and the prophets and the saints. Jesus said that was Jerusalem, Matthew chapter 23. Well, it's after the harlot was destroyed that salvation came, and then following that comes the wedding. So since the wedding is in Revelation 19 and it's in chapter 21, we have to posit chapter 20 before the wedding of chapter 19. And therefore, that wedding also has to be in the same time frame of the fall of Mystery Babylon. And so you've got the problem in trying to figure out why you are not aligning it with what's found in the text and why you're trying to push Revelation 20 beyond the demise of Mystery Babylon. Right. And that's, uh, you're reiterating my point is that you are stuck in a 70 AD. You can't go beyond that. And so everything has to be interpreted. So Babylon, the great city, everything's got to be 70 AD. That's, that's all I want people to walk away from if they're going to buy into full preterism. Well, who is the great city? If you that. don't mind, who is the great city? The, Egypt. <laughs> No, it says spiritually oh, it's called. It said spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Oh, it's, yeah, it's also Sodom. So spirit. So it's both cities. The great city is two cities in one. It's every city and no city. Uh, every city it's and the, no city. It's the great okay. city. So now, every city, every city persecuted the apostles and saints. And Jerusalem said, "Oh, more. every city, you who stones okay. the prophets." I'm and not sent. getting into interpretation okay. of, right. of Revelation. Uh, we both, we all know, in, including Donnie. Uh, we're not going to debate on the imagery of revelation and each and its, we, we would be here for days doing well, you brought my point is up. resurrection and of the death. And so what you're saying is, is that the death is not swallowed up in victory all at one time. Some of it still remains. So does, let me, and this is a yes or no. Does the death still reign over those who have not believed in Jesus? If they're not in Christ. So the death still reigns. It reigns over them if they're not in Christ, because only in Christ is life. Does can, this can, reign hold on a second. Death, can you have life outside of Christ? Does this reign of the death last forever? 
can you have life outside of Christ? Well, I'm not, this is my time. So does this reign of the death, since it's never swallowed up entirely, does it, does it rain forever? Does it, it, in other words, is it ever going to go away or is it going to rain for infinity? Death is put away for those in Christ. That's what Hebrews nine right. says. Right. But for it the says, rest of the people that are not in Christ, what about them? Well, then in my judgment, they're under death. For, for So this goes on for infinity. Of course, so the there's, there's, covers over all the nations. That's never swallowed up absolutely entirely. It, and it, is no it's, more. It's Sam, you do not have to annihilate someone in order to re destroy their power. I tell people all the time when I was a kid, I used to play with with bumblebees and uh, or, and, and honeybees and I would pull their stinger out and then I would let them crawl all over me because they couldn't do me any harm. Yeah. So if the sting of death is removed, if the strength of sin is gone, what can it do to you? It's you. You you have the power over it. You didn't have to annihilate it. Even when those nations had power over Israel, God didn't annihilate them for them to be dead. In that text in Isaiah twenty six, right. he right. says, right. "You are dead. They shall not rise." He didn't annihilate them. He took their power away and put them in the dust, defeated. So, so basically, uh, physical death that's that's for that never goes away and then the reign of death that really never goes away either except for if you believe in jesus then it goes away it, but death doesn't rain that, death doesn't that, jesus it, never really conquers it doesn't reign, reign over the people in the kingdom of god right, that's right. he said in this the very text you're quoting from isaiah 25 he says in this mountain now sam what mountain is that well, he says, how many, I will take how, the, I will how take many the mountains the covers over all the nations? Well, did he do it? <laughs> did he do it outside of the mountains? Outside, no, it, outside of it that hasn't mountain? Yet. That's the whole <laughs> point. Right? It hasn't happened yet. Well, because that's the only way you can happen. keep it going is you got to say it didn't happen. He said in this mountain, when he made that feast, that was the last day, the feast of, of tabernacles at the end of the age. In that day, death would be swallowed up. So anybody who comes to the mountain, there is no death. So the veil, it's the veil that covers over all the world. Which is There's removed in Christ. Let, let, let me finish because it's my time. All right. The image is a veil, a single veil that covers over all the nations. And that veil is called the death. And God is going to swallow it up. But you're saying he's not. What you're saying is he's only going to swallow it up for a few people. And the rest of the people, death is just going to continue on for infinity so that God never really does swallow it up. So no, no, no. call it spiritual death, call it physical death, call it whatever you want to. It doesn't make any difference. The fact of the matter is, is that the power that came through the transgression of Adam, the death, is a foreign power to God. It's a God. It, God is God is life, and what you're saying is is that God's never going to get rid of this spiritual death. He's never going to wipe it away off of His creation. He's quite pleased with it, and and because it's going to reign for infinity for eternity like He does, and so it never goes away. God never vanquishes it. He never gets rid of it, except for a small group of people that go to a Church of Christ or a Baptist church or you know some charismatic church. Or, those people get it. But the rest of mankind, eh, you know, too bad. <laughs> it this is the and this is the only point I want people to see is the disconnect, because everybody knows what death means when we talk about it in the Bible. We we know what it means. We, we it's plain. It's parsimony. It's the it's we get it. And what I want you to see here, uh, for those listening, is that what William has done for several decades now is because he's a full preterist. He's been doing this for 30 some years, for 40 some years, he's been doing that. It's 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 in the system. And so death for him does not mean what you and I mean by it every day. We, it, it does not mean that at all. And that will never go away. So life on this earth, as you understand it, God doesn't, that's not gonna change. God's not interested in changing it. Now that's the message of God's victory. And let's make sure we're getting a question in there, Sam. So my question is, is how is that a message of victory in a principality that came through the sin of Adam, which is called the death? How is letting that reign for eternity on this earth victory? 
because God gives man a choice. He says, for as in Adam, all are dying, even so in Christ are all being made alive. And of course, that was during the transition. It's a consummated thing at this point. But when, at the end of the verse, here is what the text says. Verse 56, the sting of the death is the sin and mm -hmm. the strength of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God. And you quoted this in your book, you may have abandoned that position now, yeah, but yeah. you still know the Greek there. Did the Greek change when you changed your opinion uh, no, about what, what the text what says? What do you mean by the law? It's no, not I what I heard it. you say, that it was somebody getting a driver's license or something. It's not that. But anyway, I think it's Torah here because it's the same one that reigned from Adam to Moses. That's the law entered that the offense might abound. It's the same law. The Torah reigned from Adam to Moses? No, no, no. I'm saying... The, the offense reigned from Adam to Moses. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. I'm saying it's that same law that these are parallel texts, Sam. So because, let me ask you something. Hold on, let me finish my response. Let me finish, let me finish my response. I want to make this point in response, and then I'm done. But thanks be to God. And uh, at the time Paul wrote, it says, Who is giving us the victory? What? Through Jesus Christ, not mm -hmm. outside of him, not apart from him. So you got to come to him. You quoted that. Yeah, you, you got to come to Christ. Right. Okay. Now. So without law, there is no sin, right? It says sin is not imputed when there is no law. It didn't say there was no sin. It said it's not imputed. David, the text says, blessed, to have to have sin. You have blessed to have is the man to whom the Lord does not impute sin. Right. But in order to have sin, you have to have law. Well, sin is a transgression of God's law. But if I forgive right. you for that sin, it's in uh -huh. essence like. So how can you know, sin reign in death from Adam to Moses when there is no law? Or is Paul's point, there is a law? Apparently, he's saying that, that sin is not imputed. Was there sin when, when God said uh, he imputed righteousness to Abraham and when he imputed righteousness yeah. to David? Okay. Well, Abraham was born again. So. Oh, okay. And so was David, ultimately born again. No, he was born again when he believed in God. He's born again. Well, that's that's what I'm talking about. And here's what the text says in in um uh first of all, do you believe a person who has immortality can sin? Absolutely not. No, okay. not raised all not right. when you're raised from the dead. Jesus died to uh, sin, so there's no possibility. Uh, Which is another question I want to ask you is why do you still sin? Okay. Uh I'm not under the power of the sin. However, you can still transgress the law of Christ. You can transgress the law of love. Uh, but here's the point that I'm, I'm stating in, in first What's Peter one, hold, hold on a second. Hold on a second. That's in first John five in, um, in first Peter chapter one in verse 23, Peter said they had been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Have oh, you been, God. wait a minute, wait a minute. Of course, that's the only way you can be. That's what First John, uh, I mean, uh, John 1, 12 and 13 says, which were born not of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. So you're talking about those who believe are the sons of God. They're the ones, as Jesus said, except a man is born again. He has not yet made manifest that which we are. That's because do I, like, you, do I look like a son of God to you? I can't look. They can couldn't. You, look, hold on. I like that question. Sam. Pick out the of I, God. I, I can love that God. question. Hey, that guy over there, he's the son of God. <laughs> I like that question. Guess what? The Jews couldn't even tell that Paul was a son of God in Acts chapter. I think it's Acts not chapter nine. Yet. Clearly not. No, 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 no. That had you know what manifested it. Be, see, here's the point. If they couldn't see that Paul was a son of God, let me let me tell you why they couldn't see it. In Colossians chapter three, uh, those who had been buried with Christ in baptism and risen through faith in the operation of God, and that he told, if you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above and not on the land, for you died, now watch this, Sam, you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Where, hold on, hold on. Did they have a mailing address that you could find them? Let's not see what you're doing. Uh, no, 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 no. Well, I'm going to jump in. John, John I want to jump in. We got exactly one minute. So I want to give Sam the opportunity yeah. in the last minute. If you can uh, maybe get in two more questions and then we'll wrap up this round. Go ahead. Well, in John chapter six, um, and there's so many questions that I, I think I've established what I wanted to do. 
but Jesus quotes a verse and he quotes from Isaiah. So that's a new covenant verse. Everyone would agree that what he's quoting from in John chapter six, he's quoting from Isaiah when he says they will all be taught of the Lord. And so that's that's Isaiah looking for, you know, this this new covenant kind of thing and uh, the spirit and they will all be taught of the Lord. That's the same subject matter of the all who will be raised in the last day who are taught of the Lord. And so my question is, is are you taught of the Lord, William? I'll answer that with the question. Does everyone who is taught of the Lord obey the Lord? Okay. Are, are you taught of the Lord are you, by the Spirit? Are you, does that well, pass taught of the Lord, all who are taught of the Lord? Does that apply to you? It's a simple yes or no. Does, does that apply to you or not? In, in that text, Sam, that text is referring to those who were in the first century. That's talking yeah, about the you. first Thank fruit you. saints Thank and the harvest of that you. particular That's generation. All right. That's all I need to hear. That's fine. So it does not Gentlemen. apply to you then. Okay, guys, that is uh, 50 minutes. We both got our 25-minute uh, periods to lead the way in cross-exam. And we're now jumping into five-minute closing statements. And so time has flown by. This really has been a fantastic yeah. debate. And so I appreciate uh, the time, work, energy, and effort you both put into uh, preparing for this. So let's jump into the first five minute closing statement on the affirmative side. And so uh, William Bell, whenever you're ready, you've got five minutes, go ahead. Uh, okay, all right. I've tried to point out from the scriptures that the Bible says that death reigned from Adam to Moses, which Sam agrees, and that the death is the same death that Paul was dealing with in Romans chapter six. There is a continuation of that topic in Romans chapter six. And that death was being overcome through their baptism into Christ. In that same context, it even says the death that Jesus died, he died to sin and the life that he lives, he lives to God. We talked about Hosea chapter one verses, uh, uh, Hosea one, nine through uh, 11, Hosea chapter 6, Hosea chapter 13, and even Hosea 2, though we didn't have time to go into the text, all of those passages dealing with Israel's national exile were types and shadows of the true exile that Jesus came to deliver Israel from. We pointed out that Jesus said that the harvest had already come. The fields were already white unto harvest from John chapter 4 verse 35, and that the harvest was at the last day. That was the last day of the feast from Israel's festal calendar at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. We also showed from Hebrews chapter 12 that um, the that festal occasion was already in progress, and um, they were beginning to celebrate it even as the text was written. Uh, we pointed out that the house not made with hands was the uh, spiritual body of Christ that was raised up in uh, connection with his physical death and resurrection. It was the spiritual temple transformed from his dwelling in the flesh to his dwelling in the in the spirit. Didn't get a chance to go uh, to go into all of that. We also pointed out the death that was being swallowed up was swallowed up in this mountain from Isaiah chapter 25, verses six through eight. And even in that text, it talks about the feast uh, of which Sam said nothing about. I wonder if he's still keeping the feast of tabernacles as they kept it under the old covenant, which was the reference that was made there, or uh, if he's looking for a feast which comes at the time of the, the marriage in Revelation 19, which comes after the fall of Babylon. He said that it was Babylon was every city. So when Jesus said, um, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he was literally saying, oh, every city in the world, uh, you who kills the prophets and stones, those who are uh, sent to her upon you shall come all the righteous blood. So he's charging everybody, not Jerusalem, where Paul had mentioned that it was um, uh, it, it was Jerusalem and even the book of Revelation that says that uh, is what he's saying. Then uh, in uh, Revelation 20, I pointed out that that chapter uh, and the lake of fire has to be symbolic uh, from that 
point of view because it falls between the fall of Babylon and the marriage. The marriage comes after because it says his wife has made herself ready when the judgment upon mystery Babylon comes. Well, I'd like to know when, <laughs> when every city is going to be, that, that just isn't going to work. And so that's the fulfillment of that. I touched a little bit on the air subjunctive, didn't get a chance to do a lot of that, but uh, that's showing you that the process of rising had already begun in baptism with the air subjunctive, but the real future is there to show that that process of their rising from sin was not consummated and was parallel to 1 Corinthians 15. Now, I had a chart on board. I didn't get a chance to put it up, and that was the, the uh, uh, resurrection in black and white where there is a comparison between Romans 6 and 1 Corinthians 15 in every detail. Uh, just wish I had had time to do it. Needed a couple of affirmatives to get that done, but I just didn't do it. How much time left, uh, Brother Dunny? Uh, you have exactly one minute, William. Oh, still got, still got a minute. Let's see. He he tried to say that Acts 17.30 was the final judgment at the end of time. We pointed out that that was a parallel with all the constituent elements of Matthew 24.14, that then the end would come. And then when he tried to make the end an end of time, it doesn't say that. That's talking about the end of the age, heaven and earth, the old Jerusalem temple, etc., would pass away, but my words would never pass away. That's the gospel. We went to Isaiah 66 to show that the new heavens and the new earth would remain, and uh, that even as it remained, God would uh, send out gospel emissaries to continue to teach, and that those who had seen what had uh, taken place would also see the dead corpses, etc. Those are the corpses that fell at the time of that prophecy uh, being fulfilled. Let's ten see. Seconds. Uh, 10 seconds. Well, I'm out. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. William, thank you very much for that five minute concluding statement. Now we're going to hand it over to uh, Sam. Sam, whenever you're ready, you also have a five minute concluding statement and the floor is yours. Well, what I wanted to demonstrate as a former believer in full preterism, the way that, that William uh, is, and having, um, by the grace of God, studied my way out of it because of the multiple uh, large looming problems that it runs into. Um, the first being is that the language that we use that's been demonstrated tonight is we, we don't have the same definitions at all on anything. Um, there's not much we agree on because we, we so radically have redefined everything. And when I was a full preterist, I was realizing I was doing this with the evangelical friends that I had when they would say, well, what about this? What about that? I'd have to redefine everything. And you saw that demonstrated tonight when even a simple psalm like Psalm 90, which is talking about 70 years, 80 years to a person's life. Teach us to number our days, Lord, so that we might have uh, reward in our in our works. Uh, God says to him, return to the dust, O sons of men. So that's not just given to Adam. In the singular, you will return. That's singular to Adam. You will return to the dust and to dust you, Adam, you will return. Here, what happened to Adam is now happening to everybody, returning to the dust. So the connection is, <laughs> the, the connection is obvious. But the full preterist can't have that connection because if they do, it, full preterism goes away. It, you can't have resurrection of the dead in 70 AD. It, it's, 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 it's obvious. That's why I've hammered on death, on the death, the death that came through Adam, return to the dust, you singular Adam, is now applied to return to the dust, O sons of men, plural. So whatever happened to Adam happens to the sons of men. What is it? Well, they turn to re they return to the dust. Well, what does that mean? You sweep me in away in the sleep of death. There's the asleep in death. Asleep in death. There it is. Uh, those who uh, Paul says uh, many witnesses have seen the Lord Jesus, although many have fallen asleep in death. They're dead. No brainer, folks. That that <laughs> you don't need to know Greek, which is why I purposely have not brought. Greek up in any of that because it, this is so understandable and what Moses goes on to say he, he explicitly states um, teach us the number of our days um, the length of our days is 70 years or 80 
if we have enough strength, uh, yet they're spanned and, and or is full of, so, of sorrow and, and grief. And I've, I've been alive for 56 years. My sister has died. My dad has died. I've had friends that have passed away. I've, I've, I can't, I, I've, um, but you know what? In William Bell's version, none of that, none of that. And I want you to hear this. None of that has to do with the redemption of Jesus Christ. None of it. So whatever tears, whatever sorrow, whatever, that has nothing to do with the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, according to William Bell and full preterism. Nothing, nothing at all. So the very things that we go through on a daily basis, that the Bible uses the same language of so that we, we can identify with the Bible, we can read the scriptures, and we, we can have them on our hearts and in our minds and our, because we understand what it is that they're saying. When it says suffering, I know what that looks like. Not spiritual suffering, actual suffering, actual tears that brings actual tears to us. The full preterist says that has nothing to do with the redemption of Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing. They have to do this because even the death does not mean what you think it means. The reign of the death does not mean physical. We die or people are blown up or Ukraine war or any of that. That doesn't have anything to do with anything. You get this Gnostic disconnect from everyday reality that the Bible is operating in. And that's all that I wanted to show tonight. And when I saw myself doing that as a full preterist, realizing I'm disconnecting with everything that other people make sense out of, I'm so high up here in, in Gnostic disconnect, esoteric world, redefining all of these terms that I can't identify with anybody down here anymore. Because they're talking about death, pain, suffering, cancer. They're talking about all this stuff. And I just say to them, that doesn't have anything to do with what Jesus did. <laughs> and it's a, it's a, you can see the mouths drop. Like, what are you talking about? So I'm appealing to that because I think seconds. so even in John six, when I quote the passage that Jesus is quoting from Isaiah 54, and I said, does that apply to you taught of the Lord? William Bell consistently, and I'll give him that consistently said, no, it does not. Right. Hardly any of the new Testament applies to you anymore. It only applied to that generation living in the fulfillment and the 70 AD. And that leaves us very, very, very little, maybe, that applies to us today. And we'll argue about that. So, you know, we're not under the law. We don't need the law. We don't need, you know, and we might still <laughs> sin, but it's not sin that has anything to do with the sin that's in Adam. It's a completely Five different seconds. type of sin. So it's just disconnect. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for those concluding statements. This uh, debate has been really excellent. It's been comprehensive. And I appreciate that. We do have quite a few audience questions, uh, William and Sam. And so what we'll do is get through as many as we can within our 25 to 30 minutes. And since this is uh, the first time you both have appeared on the Standing for Truth debate platform, I do appreciate it. How we typically run the Q&As. Uh, the, the question and answer period is basically whoever the question is for, in order to move along smoothly, we just make sure they get the last word. So for example, say the question's for Sam. Sam, you get to respond. William, you can give a response as well. And then we would just throw it back to Sam for a final word. Right. And so with that, we will start with our first question. So uh, this comes in from New Heaven and New Earth Unveiled. $10 Super Chat. I appreciate the support and the questions for you, Sam. Regardless of when it's fulfilled, do you believe 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51 teaches the living will experience the same change as the dead, or do they also have to die to be changed? You know, the force of the verb there is that the living and the dead are changed. So both both are included in the all shall be changed so we all shall not fall asleep but we all shall be changed uh in jewish literature falling asleep means the re in fact there's one book that i have that actually says this um on on i don't know if it's moore's work or edersheim or somebody uh, uh some uh, some other but 
the, the, uh, where fallen asleep is recline of the body. So the body is asleep. So it's a funeral term. It's a, it's a term for fallen asleep. In fact, Paul already used the term fallen asleep. Many witnesses have seen Jesus, though many have fallen asleep, meaning they're buried, they're entombed, uh, their bodies are in recline. So when he says not all shall fall asleep, that's what he's referring to. He does not say we shall not all die. He does not. That would contradict in Adam all die. Mortality is at work in all that are in Adam. So that would be a radical contradiction. But he deliberately picks his words. We shall not all sleep. And why he says that is because at the descent of Christ in the light of the glory of God of creation, 2 Corinthians 10, which this is in now in jars of clay. But when God appears in the light of the glory of the descent of Jesus Christ, there's not going to be any arguments. It's the last day. That's it. And Paul envisions in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, that these things will happen. And that did not happen the month of Av in 70 AD for saints that were in Thessalonica, Corinth, Gaul, or Parthia. Um, perhaps didn't even know that the temple fell until several weeks later when news traveled to them. So maybe they got a reverberation in the spirit or something while they were walking around in Parthia. Uh, a reverberation of the spirit on the on the ninth of Ab reverberated, and they say, "Hey, you know what? I think the spirit. I think the spirit just told me the temple fell. We are in the age to come." I, <laughs> I, see, I, all of theology has to have a practical element to it, and and how it relates and how it replies. And I also tried to ask what that change looks like for those that were living in the month of Ab, 70 AD, around 5.30 p.m. when the temple was burning, for those that were living in Corinth, Gaul, Parthia, and Thessalonica. Sam, thank you for the response. William, over to you. The floor is yours. Okay, regardless of when it's fulfilled, do you believe 1 Corinthians 15, 51 teaches the living will experience the same change as the dead, or do they also have to be changed? Uh, from the perspective of 1 Corinthians uh, 15, remember that the text says um, there were some who denied the resurrection of the dead ones. And the living were already participating in the process of resurrection. Mm -hmm. As Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, he says, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection out from the dead ones. So use the word ex anastasin to talk about what was taking place out from the dead ones. Well, what had Paul participated in? He had participated in dying and rising with Christ. He only said that that process was not complete. It was not complete because as Romans 11 teaches, uh, when the scripture says, and so all Israel shall be saved, it says, for the deliverer will come out of Zion and will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant to them when I take away their sins. He's quoting from Isaiah 27, starting in verse 9, when he talked about all the chalk stones of the uh, altar being uh, crushed to dust, etc. And the wooden images and everything would not stand when the fortified city would be made desolate, when Judah and Israel would be gathered together, which we see that taking place, as we've already quoted in First Peter chapter 1, uh, because he says, when uh, he said to them who were not his people, then they would be his people. Well, that's the bringing together of Judah and Israel into the one body of Christ, um, um, and, and that is the time frame for the fulfillment of that gathering that you see in, um, Isaiah 27, leading down to verse 13, which he says, and that is also when the trumpet is blown. Well, that's Matthew 24, 31 and the time of Jubilee, when all of that would take place before that generation, uh, passed away. So the dead ones were already physically dead, but since the text says that, and it's talking about the dead ones. He didn't ask, how are the living coming forth? They, they weren't denying the resurrection of the living, which is what Sam has to be saying. They were denying the resurrection of the dead ones. And so he says, how are the dead ones being raised up? And with what body do they come? Sam recognized that in his book because he talked about the fact that he's talking third person there as opposed to first or second person. So he was talking about a group of the dead ones whose resurrection was being denied. They didn't deny their own resurrection. They didn't deny the resurrection of those who had fallen asleep in Christ. And um, 
so they weren't denying that if they if it was about a physical body how could they have believed even in their own resurrection that's not the point that's why paul used the argument against them to say well if uh, if the dead ones don't rise then christ will not rise but christ yeah, was right. a part of the dead ones christ had solidarity with them he was a pre cross saint, if you please, from that perspective, he, he rose, you know, from his death, resurrection at the cross. So those were dead ones who were dead before. Let me end on giving the reason I believe that uh, their resurrection was being denied. We didn't get a chance to go into this because the debate is just too short. But um, here's what was taking place. Even with the denial of Hymenaeus and Philetus in, in uh, 2 Timothy 2, 18 and 19, in that text when they were saying the resurrection is past already, well, Paul had already said just a couple of verses earlier, uh, if we have died with Christ, we shall live with him. And then a couple of verses later, he says he was about to judge the living and the dead. So he couldn't have been teaching what Hymenaeus and Philetus taught. Now, Hymenaeus and Philetus were Jews. 20 seconds, William. Okay, they were Jews. They were rejecting that because in Acts 6, when they said, we've heard him say blasphemous words that Jesus of Nazareth is going to come and destroy this temple and change the customs that Moses delivered unto us. Well, if they had um, they had taught in Acts 15, uh, come down and taught that they had to keep the law and uh, be circumcised in order to be saved. Well, if the dead ones were going to rise through the gospel, it would mean that the temple and all of those things would not apply to them. They were going to be raised in Christ. And so the dead ones, the Judaizers who wanted to continue the law is the reason they were denying the resurrection of the dead, because if they had acknowledged them, they themselves would have to deny their own uh, denial of resurrection. It just doesn't make sense. Okay, William, thank you for the response. Sam, question was for you, and therefore you get the, the final response. Go ahead. Um. Well, hearing, now keep in mind, in order to understand 1 Corinthians 15, you have to go back through everything William just said, because without that, you're not going to understand 1 Corinthians 15. That's my, that's my point. Everything he just said, you have to have, you must understand everything he just said in order to unlock the mysteries of 1 Corinthians 15. That's that's how it works. In other words, as I remember discussing over the phone with Don Preston, Don, we will never start with 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, no, we can't. We got to go to Matthew 24. Yes. If you just read 1 Corinthians 15, there's no way in the world you would get all of that out of there. No way in the world. No way. And for the last 2,000 years, no one has whether you're Ethiopian, whether you're English, whether you're Asian, it doesn't make any difference. No one has ever gotten that out of there. That, that's my point. It's a system that you have to buy into in order to read into the text, as I did in my book, Exegetical Essays, which Don Preston still publishes, so I know what I'm talking about. And I knew what I was doing when I wrote that book. And I have that book and I've reread that book and there's numerous mistakes, numerous, numerous vicious bias that's going on because I have to keep it in 70 A.D. First Corinthians cannot go beyond 70 A.D. And so I read that assumption into the text of 70 of First Corinthians 15, Romans 6 through 8. It doesn't make any difference. Heck, we even seen it tonight with Psalm 90. You can't even read Psalm 90 without 70 AD and talking about Israel's in the 40 year wandering period. You, <laughs> you can't read any. And I want people to that are flirting with full preterism to realize this. If you're going to buy into this, you're going to go the whole route. Because, see, it's a system. It's a whole system. So even death doesn't mean what we think it means anymore. Falling asleep doesn't mean what we think it means anymore. It's just for old covenant Israel that fell asleep in the old covenant. Talking about Israelites there. It's not talking about people that died in uh, uh, Sumeria or Mesopotamia. It's not talking about the Hittites. 20 it's seconds. It's not talking yeah. about any of those kinds of people. It's just talking about Israel that fell asleep in the Old Covenant Israel and the Old Covenant body of Adam. Did you get that? 
Did you get that out of 1 Corinthians 15? I didn't think so. You have to read it into the text, which is what I did in exegetical essays. And I actually, I state that in the book. So it's a vicious bias. It's a bias reading that is built on 70 AD is the end goal. Therefore, everything must fit into that. That's what we're doing here. Okay, Sam, thank you for the final word. Gentlemen, thank you for the comprehensive answers. For the next question, we have a question for both. And so what we'll do here, since there's not necessarily a, a third response for this one, since it is a question for both, we'll go two minutes each, two minutes each. And so this comes from Lazarus Conley. Um, and the question is, Hope Resurrected Podcast, $5 Super Chat. Okay, appreciate it. So the questioner asks, if Jesus ceased being human in 70 AD, why does he say he's son of man, which means he's human in Matthew 25? Um, I guess since Sam got the last word on the previous yeah. question, to be fair, maybe we'll have Sam start with this one. And then William, that way you can get the final word on question two. Okay. Okay. I'm having some yeah. mic problems here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah I can okay. hear you. William. Okay. All right. Now it's, it's getting a little bit better. Okay. Um, if Jesus ceased being human in 70 AD, why does he say he's the son of man, which means that he's human in Matthew 25? Well, personally, I don't think that the term son of man um, always refers to one who is um, in a physical body. And the reason for that is um, in Mark chapter 16 and verse 12, the Bible says Jesus changed his form uh, even before he was raised from the dead. It says that he changed his form. Now, I don't know which form he changed into or morphed back into, uh, at, at least ultimately back into the physical body. But I don't know what exactly that means when it says that he changed his form. And when he was um, out, uh, or when he had died, you know, you could still refer to him as such. Uh, in the, um, let's see, um, I know that that term sometimes is referred to as a, a prophet. So I don't, just personally, I don't think that it's limited to saying, well, because he's called the son of man, that he is, uh, that means that he's physical in, in that particular point. Um, when Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, uh, the Bible says it was a light that shone round about. And I don't think that was evident when he was on earth from that perspective, when he was before his incarnation and then he came to be a man as a result of birth. Um, you know, that's one thing, but I just personally, I don't see, and I don't have very much to say about that, but I don't see that that term within itself is limited to his being human unless you can, you know, give me a text that says son of man means that you're human. And that's the only uh, restriction that it is. You know, uh, I'll wait for the evidence. Thank you, William. Sam, floor is yours. Well, here's uh, here's another um, <laughs> here, here's another where you can go to any encyclopedia, any Christian. And, you know, I've got a they, and they all say the same things. The Aramaic. Here's first century audience relevance, right? So what's a, what's a Jew mean by it? Um, and it means human being. It's a son of a man. I'm a son of man. Daniel's called a son of man. Ezekiel's called a son of man. Angels are never called sons of men. They're called sons of God, but they're never called sons of men. Sons of man just means basically, and you can go to any, uh, any, any go anywhere, any reference. It means human. Some, in fact, some translators translate it as human being. I've used that translation several times. We're just human being. So he's human being. In fact, Psalms, uh, Psalm 8 applies it, sons of man. What is it that you're mindful of the son of man? So right there, he's applying it to human beings. He's not talking about angels. He's talking about people who are born of men, sons of men. That, that's, that's, you're, that's what, a, <laughs> but not in full preterism. Can't have that because uh, the problem is, is that if it means human being, then Jesus is going to return in 70 AD on the clouds of heaven. The sun, then you will see the son of man on the clouds of heaven in 70 AD, but he's no longer son of man. Uh, Don Preston tells us that Jesus was reabsorbed back into the Logos and he is no longer a human being, but the Logos quote unquote 
retains the memory of when he was a human being. Did you get that? Catch the power of that. Don Preston and William Bell's definition of son of man is that the Logos reabsorbed Jesus of Nazareth so that Jesus of Nazareth no longer exists. Rather, the memory of Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth exists in the mind of the Logos. I want you to catch the full power of that. Now, forget eschatology. Forget 78. Forget. Yeah, we'll argue about that. You know, whatever. Forget it. Just, we're talking about Christology now. So now my eschatology is forcing me to redefine my Christology. Everything according to 70 AD. 70 AD must stand. If soteriology gets in the way, so be it. If ecclesiology gets in the way, so be it. If Christology gets in the way, so be it. 70 AD must stand. 70 AD must stand. And if it redefines the entire catalog and entire encyclopedia. 10 seconds. Then so be it. Because 70 AD must stand. And that's how it works. And we're witnessing this tonight. So even the son of man doesn't mean what you think it means. Okay. Thank you, Sam. And to be fair, uh, Sam got the last word on question one. And so William, let's give you the last word here. And uh, if you could, maybe roughly a minute response. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I won't I'll spend a lot of time with it. The scripture tells us even in the book of Revelation that it was an unveiling of Jesus Christ. And uh, that indicates that there had to be events in order to unveil him. Jesus said in John 17, uh, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world was. I don't see him in a human physical body before the world was from that perspective. And in Revelation 1, 12, when it talks about the Son of Man, it says in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. Of course, you can say that that's uh, the Son of Man. But again, I personally... Um, do not believe that son of man uh, has to be restricted to just a, a human uh, being that it may have a divine reference from that perspective. And I want to say one other thing. Sam keeps saying all of these people believe this. Well, you know, I'm personally not one who will follow a multitude to do evil. And then he keep bring, bring, keeps bringing up Psalm 90. Uh, Psalm 90 is about several things in the text that have a short uh, span whether he's talking about the grass that grew, that grew the night or the or the watches etc or a man's life he says it's just a short period of time so his point is not and the issue as sam is trying to make it that i'm denying that a man will live to be 80 years old because i believe that that event happened in the wrath of moses is is a false it's it's a straw man uh, everything that he uses in that illustration is to illustrate something that was a short period of time. James says man's life is a vapor. The night is short. A watch in the night is even shorter. The grass comes up today, dies tomorrow, et cetera. Those are the points that he's making in Psalm 90, not mm -hmm. the point that Sam is trying to foster on me. Thank you. Okay, William, thank you for that final word. Now, the next question, I feel like I can combine in two. And so let's see, there's a question here, uh, $2 mm -hmm. Super Chat, SF Wisdom. Now, the question is, is God the God of the dead or the living? But I've also got one saved here that, let me just pull it up. We have a lot of questions here. This is from Transatlantic Whirlwind, $10 Super Chat. And this individual is asking for both of your thoughts on Luke 20 all the way up to 38. But I feel like verse 38 is that verse for he is not a God yeah. of the dead, but of the living. So maybe if we could kind of combine those both, um, but it is a question for both. So William started with the previous one. Therefore, Sam, if you'd like to, you could start on this one. Uh, yeah, this is really a, a, uh, a powerful answer that Jesus gives to the Sadducees. First of all, the Sadducees only accepted the Pentateuch as the scriptures. They didn't accept anything else. This is why Jesus doesn't quote Daniel. Uh, he could have quoted numerous passages, but he doesn't. He just goes right into what seems like an odd passage, uh, which doesn't have anything to do with resurrection. But he's being asked in the resurrection. So the context is resurrection. That's that is the con. He's not at, he's not being asked about the ontology of God or the Trinity. He's not. Nope. He's being asked about the resurrection of the dead. 
So the, the Sadducees had a fixed definition of what that meant. Jesus understood what they meant by what they meant. He understood their question. He knew exactly what it meant. And the Pharisees also understood what the question, because they undoubtedly had heard it many times before. And so they're, they're, they, they got Jesus here and the Pharisees are like, okay, well, let's, let's hear his answer. And what's interesting is that at the end of it, the scribe of the Pharisees says, good answer. That's fantastic. In other words, the Pharisees agreed. Here's a rare occurrence where you have the Pharisees agreeing over against the Sadducees. And Jesus is agreeing with the Pharisees. The Pharisees are agreeing with Jesus on the nature of the resurrection of the dead. When you read the Mishnah Talmud, when you read the uh, the oral Torah written, uh, one of the favorite see, sayings that you see uh, among rabbinical scholars, you know, second century BCE or, or CE, is uh, that uh, the uh, cursed are those who say that the resurrection of the dead is not taught in the first five books of Moses. And that's that's one of it. You see this repeated over and over again. Because there was a group saying that the resurrection in the first five books of Moses is nowhere taught. And so that's that kind of tradition that Second Temple Judaism that's going on there, which Jesus is talking about. But he brings in Exodus uh, 3, 6 there. And he quotes this verse uh, that I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of uh, Jacob. I am the God, or I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And sitting here and looking at it, um, where he says, Elokeinu, Avicha, Elokeim, Abarham. Very definite meaning. What does that mean? What does that got to do with anything? Well, it's because of I am. Present tense. Currently, I am Abraham's God. Now, when Moses spoke, when God spoke to Abraham or, or Moses in Exodus 3, 6, where this is coming from, Abraham's dead. Well, how can he be dead if God is his God? Now, I was the God of Abraham. The force of it is in the I am. I am Abraham's God. Abraham currently is worshiping me. He is my servant. I am his God currently, right now, as we speak. And I'm also the God of Isaac. And I'm also the God of Jacob and everybody else. And then Jesus, in his exegesis, infers from this rightly so logically so god is not the god of the dead meaning abraham and isaac and jacob are alive but of the living and that's the force of the verb i am and so if that's the case that abraham and isaac and jacob at the time that jesus was speaking is alive to god but yet dead on earth and not raised from the dead, clearly. Then how can someone be alive and not raised from the dead? You do err in not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. And the scribes or, or and the Sadducees never asked him another question after that one. Why? He just nailed them. <laughs> he just flat out nailed them right there. Because once you see what it is that he's saying, I am the God of Abraham, which means that Abraham is alive to me, but he's not yet raised from the dead. So Abraham, by faith, is born again. He dies. He's absent from body. He's present with the Lord, awaiting resurrection of the dead. You have come to Mount Zion. You have come to the church of the firstborn. You've come to this great cloud of witnesses who are already there, but have not yet received that which is promised, resurrection of the dead, so that together they with us we all shall receive in the last day the full inheritance of all that God has created for us. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5, for it is not to angels that God has subjected the inhabitable world, oikumene, but it is to us. And then he quotes Psalm 8, which is the son of man. What are you mindful of him that you gave him dominion over all things in the earth? Not heaven, the earth. So that we could have dominion over all things. But as long as sin and death is operating and doing what it is that we're doing, yet at present we do not see all things subjected to us. But we see Jesus, the Son of Man, who is human and who has been given all things, to which we are co-heirs, and whatever he has will also be ours. Sam, thank you for that response. William Bell, over to you, and the floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay. Um... 
some of what Sam says I agree with. I just don't agree with his time frame for uh, the text. Um, the passage starts off with um, the Sadducees asking a question about uh, the levered marriage law, which is from Deuteronomy chapter 25. And um, because they rejected the resurrection, so by placing this hypothetical question before them, uh, their assumption was that in the resurrection, uh, if it is the kind of resurrection that has to do with physical bodies, then this woman had had seven husbands and therefore in the resurrection, whose was going to be her husband. The way the Jews um, um, understood immortality from a physical point of view was through procreation. And that's the reason why um, they would have to raise up a seed, the, the man would have to raise up a seed to his deceased brother um, and, and therefore that seed would belong to his deceased brother so that his name would not be uh, put out of Israel. And, uh, but because they assumed that physical procreation was required to produce sons as it did in the old covenant uh, from, from the perspective of being born into the covenant of Israel, he said the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who count it worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor given in marriage, neither can they die anymore for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. Uh, when Jesus spoke in John one, where he said, I saw the heaven open and the angels of God or the uh, angels of God were descending and ascending upon the son of man. He was quoting the stairway or staircase, uh, which is temple typology from uh, 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 Genesis, I think it's chapter 28, uh, Jacob, what we call Jacob's ladder. And uh, in that text, it says Yahweh was at the top of the ladder, but there were angels ascending and, and, and descending. Well, in, um, um, in this text, he says that they were descending upon the son of man. And uh, so he's just talking about he was the access into heaven uh, for them and um, giving them th that, illust uh, that illustration by quoting that text from, uh, from Genesis in um, John chapter one. Now, I agree that the text says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. However, I have some questions with the idea that we say that they were already spiritually raised because in Hebrews 9.15, the text says that these all died, uh, excuse me, in 915, it says that Christ died for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant. And again, in 1139 and 40, which I quoted before, he said, these all died in faith, not having received the promise. The promise was the promise of resurrection. They had an opportunity to be raised physically, some of them, Hebrews 1134, but it says they chose not to be in order that they might receive a better resurrection. And, you know, you can raise a person from the dead, even if he's a sinner and it won't put him any closer to God. He needs to be raised in Christ in order for uh, his for him to have access to the father. And, and so sin has to be removed. So I think what the text is saying is that um, God is speaking proleptically because of that honor roll of faith, saying that I am the God of the living, that the promise of their raising was so sure in Christ that uh, he could speak as though it had already come, just like he would say he calls things that are not as though they are. So I kind of think that that's the point. Uh, the other issue is that even though he put the Sadducees to silence and Pharisees were uh, grateful for that, they were happy and excited about it, not all of them agreed with Jesus because they didn't all agree with Paul. And that was one of the reasons why the Pharisees had him on trial because of this one question and that was the resurrection of the dead. So they didn't agree with everything that they said. And so we only have to look at, you know, from a selective point of view that some of the Pharisees did, but some of them totally rejected because their idea of resurrection was raising them back into the land, uh, which would be understood from even some of the prophecies like Ezekiel 37. They would they would even uh, think something like that. So that's my thoughts on it. And um, but I believe that it's not because they um, are still, I think, that again was at the end of the age because he says the people of this age and it was in the age of Moses where they practiced the levered la marriage law and uh, beyond that um, that covenant is um, is not being practiced today from that uh, perspective. 
William, thank you for that response. And so for this one, Sam, we'll give you the last word and we'll give you a minute to uh, to respond. Go ahead. Well, again, you, what is rather simple in Jesus' answer is, is I am. And we can find this in Second Temple Judaism again. You can find it in Wisdom. Uh, you, there's some fragments in the Dead Sea Scrolls of the multiple books of, of Dead Sea Scroll studies where there was this belief of afterlife. It's very clear. Uh, the Jews referred to this, that the absent from the body, present with the Lord. Paul is not inventing something brand new there. Uh, he's Jewish. He's known the literature. Again, it made it even into the Septuagint, uh, where uh, like the Book of Wisdom, which talks about this, that those that are in the hand of the Lord, that upon death, God, they are in God's hands. So it's it's that kind of thing that's going on. And they be, they believed that Abraham was in, as, in a, a, a spirit, uh, separated at death so abraham is dead so their idea of resurrection was that spirit would unite again with body when the body is raised up out of the death if the, you find this in second temple judaism so the language that jesus is in this again um all of the modern uh, works that i uh, read um anymore today th th this is this is pretty staple um, with the last 50 years of Dead Sea Scroll studies and Second Temple Judaism studies and what people are coming out with and what it was. Um, and even rabbinical Jews are coming out and saying, yes, we, we, we affirm resurrection of the dead. That's the language that's being used. We know the language is being used by the Sadducees and what, what it is that they mean. They think they have a trick there because they're not denying physical resurrection. They're using physical resurrection. They're assuming physical resurrection. But they have an idea that if physical resurrection occurs, does marriage law still 15 apply? Fifteen seconds. And Jesus says, "No, marriage does not apply in the resurrection. Marriage will no longer apply." But you know, if we're already raised or if we're raised in the dead now, why are we still giving them marriage and being married? These are everyday terms that everyday people understand. That's who Jesus is appealing to, and it was a great answer that he gave because they never spoke to him after that one again because it was clear. Okay, gentlemen, thank you for your responses on that question. Next one comes in from Awesome Lawson Clips, $10 super chat. Appreciate the support. <clears throat> and I believe the question's for you, William. So we'll work through it together. Second Peter 3 says that in the last days there will be scoffers who mock, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Wouldn't preterists fall into this category? The answer to that question is no, because we do not mock his coming. We affirm his coming. We state very clearly that Christ came in 70 AD in connection with the temple. The temple was a sign that manifested his coming. So we're not denying the coming of the Lord. As a matter of fact, it's the people who argue for a denial of the fact that he came that the scoffers would more apply to, even though I personally wouldn't apply to them, because then we would take, be taking the text out of context these scoffers are scoffers that came in the last days. The last days were in process in the first century. And as I've said earlier, uh, the last day of that age was when the temple was destroyed. So we are not in the last days. We're in the age that followed the last days. And um, when you look in Second Peter, as a matter of fact, I think that a person ought to start in First Peter because Second Peter is a reminder of what Jesus had said in First Peter. And in First Peter, he had told them that the um, they had been kept, verse 5, by the power of God through faith for salvation that was ready to be revealed in the last time, in the last days. Jesus was put to death in the last days. That was before the day of Pentecost. That was before Christianity started officially. So the last days couldn't have been the last days of the age of Christ or the, the uh, age to come. That age has no end. They had to be the end of an age that had an end. And that would have been the old covenant age, the, the last days. The scripture says in, in Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. That's talking about the last days. And uh, that's Galatians 4 and verse 4. Then in 1 Peter, uh, a text that I referred to, Peter said that um, Christ was ready to judge the living and the dead, that the end of all things was near, and um, that the time for the judgment had begun. So what the scoffers are denying is what I had referred to before in Acts chapter six and seven, that Jesus of Nazareth would come 
which they called blasphemous words and destroyed this place, referring to the temple and changed the customs that Moses had delivered to them. So they were coming scoffing against that. And they are referred to in Isaiah 28, 16 through 18 as well. But they were scoffing against that. And that's why he says they came in the last days doing that. Notice if you stay with the text and audience relevance in chapter two, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. So in reading that context, these scoffers are those who were there in the first century and um, they were denying that Jesus was coming uh, in connection with the fall of the temple because they wanted the temple and its practice to continue on like those in second Timothy two 18 and, uh, and others. Appreciate it. William, Sam, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, they would fall under that category. Uh, second Peter, there is referencing to those who are asking, where's the promise of his parousia? Where's the promise of, 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 of his glory? Um, this is a typical question we find in the opening of, uh, for example, Amy Jill Levine's book. She's she's a Jewish, a very well-respected scholar. But most Jews that you hear, they can't believe that Jesus is the Messiah because death, rape, murder, child molestation, kidnapping, slavery, all this stuff. What what changed? That's that's a Jewish question being asked. You still hear this question today. What did Jesus change? Did he take away murder, rape, war, destruction, earthquakes, Maui fires? Uh, possibly 1,300 just consumed and burned up in their uh, horrible, hor horrible, uh, just absolute horrible. Uh, where's the glory of God at? If your God is king, Jesus is the king and all power and authority has been given to him and he will dash the nations and he will be given possession of the, of the, of the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he will do all the things that you say that this Yeshua Jesus is going to do. Please, please, where is he? Where, 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 where is it? Has he ended anything? Name me one crime that Jesus has ended. Just one, just one. That is a legitimate beef. That That is a serious, that's a serious, serious, serious charge. And Peter is saying that they deliberately forget their own scriptures because he states about the time of the days of Noah. And he talks about the formation of the heavens and the earth. So we got to go back to Genesis chapter one. So from the time of Genesis chapter one to the time of Moa, of Noah. And now was there a lot of sin going on during that time? Oh, it, it got so bad. And everybody that knows the book of Noah knows this the, or the book of Genesis, which is what Peter's referring to. It got so bad that every heart of the imagination of man was on evil continually. And so he yet just found Noah. So it was not, so that, that's a big span of time right there. And what is it that they deliberately forgot that these people scoffing, what is it that they deliberately forgot? This is what, this is what they forgot. And this is in Jeremiah, it's in Isaiah, it's all over the place. But this, this is what they forgot. But not so, but you brothers do not forget this one thing that with the Lord of day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day, which means this, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to everlasting life. Why doesn't God wipe out the wicked? Why doesn't God destroy everything right now? Jeremiah asks the same question, God, wipe them all out. And God comes back and says, Jeremiah, do you really want me to do that? Do you really want me to do that? Why doesn't God do this? Because he's patient. He puts up with us. He's patient. Paul talks about in times of God's been patient with us. We, think of the horrible things that we do on this earth that, that, that are unspeakable that neither William nor I would ever do. Unspeakable things. And God puts up with that. But there's coming a time, a day which is set in which he will judge the world when he is no longer going to put up with it. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, the end of all things has come upon us. Repent as it's called today, while it's still expressed as today and God is showing his patience with you because his patience 
is going to run out. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that. It proves it. The dead shall be raised. The world shall be judged. This is going to end. It has arrived upon us already through Jesus Christ. And so why he's calling it today, repent, it's because God is patient with you. God is merciful with you because he does not want you to perish. He wants to save you before that day of judgment comes when no more preaching of the gospel, no more. That's it. That's it. So what Peter is saying here is the gospel. What Peter is saying here is the message that these scoffers deliberately forget the patience of God. God's not slow in his promises. God does not delay in his promises. God doesn't do any of those types of things. Rather, God is patient. And is he not exercising patience with us today? Yes. Yes, he is. Blessed be his name. Okay, thank you, Sam. Uh, for this one, William, we're going to give you the final word. And so uh, let's say between a minute and two minutes, and the floor is yours. Okay. Um, first of all, I think the idea that um, all human life and um, choice or will is going to be snuffed out is totally foreign to the scriptures. Even in the text that Sam quoted back from Genesis, God said that he would never again destroy all living things, nor would he ever curse the ground as he had done. As long as the earth remained, uh, seed time and harvest, uh, winter and summer, et cetera, spring, you know, all of that would continue. And we don't have any text that ever says that would end. As a matter of fact, God uses those material uh, bodies to indicate that the kingdom of God would last as long as the sun and the moon. Um, Psalm 72, verse 17, Psalm 89, verse 34 and 35. Uh, the kingdom and the throne would last as long as the sun and the moon. So if you're going to get rid of the sun and the moon, you'll have to get rid of the kingdom as well. In Isaiah 65, the text uh, tells us um, in verse 20, no more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who is not fulfilled his days, for the child shall die a hundred years old. Being, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be a curse. So we're looking at the new heavens and new earth, and God is still saying there would be a sinner who would die. Not only that, he says they're going to build houses, inhabit them. I don't know how we're going to get lumber, you know, trekked up to heaven, uh, literal heaven, in order to be able to do these things. They shall not build in another uh, inhabit they shall not plant so here's where sam is going to have to go and say well all of this is apocalyptic the very thing that he's been charging me with because it talks not only about that it also talks about they're going to bring forth children and they're certainly not going to do it without marriage according to god's law and uh, they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the lord and their offspring with them another text is jeremiah chapter 31 verse 27 he says the days are coming says the lord that he would sow the house of israel and the house of judah with the seed of man and the beast and uh, he says in verse 29, in those days, they shall say no more. The father has eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Three times in the text, he talks about behold, the days is coming. So he's referring that to the time of the new covenant in um, uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. When he talks about the Feast of Tabernacles that everyone had to keep once all these things were fulfilled. Uh, and this is in a spiritual sense, the very one I was talking about in Hebrews 12, he says, it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship, that's the new Jerusalem, that's not a physical Jerusalem or a geocentric one, uh, to worship the King, the Lord of hosts on them will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. Notice he says, they have to come up and enter in. And he says, if they don't, this shall be the punishment. The word uh, in the Greek for that is harmatia. This shall be the sin of those who do not come up. And then I'll end on uh, Revelation chapter 21 that talks about in the new um, heavens and earth, in the holy city that is spoken of here, it says in verse 24, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light and the kings of the earth bring or are bringing their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 22, he says, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may enter or have the right to the tree of life. So this is talking about when they have the right to the tree of life, 
that they may enter through the gates into the city, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and uh, sexually immoral, etc. So God is not going to change the free will of people. There will be people who will sin, but there will seconds. also be uh, there will also be those who will forever be following righteousness, just like Sam said. He's not going to do those things. Neither am I, neither are you, and neither are a whole lot of people. And that's why his mercy and grace extends world without end so that he can bring in as many people as he wants. We're the ones trying to put a limit on God and say, you don't need any more people. I'm not going to do it. Okay, thank you very much for the final word there, uh, William. Okay, so the next question for the next two questions, last two questions, basically, we'll, we'll uh, kind of do a power round. Uh, William, I will say you've kind of been in the hot seat tonight in terms of the Q&A. Most of the Super Chats were for you, and so I appreciate <laughs> you being a good sport. So the next one is for you as well. This comes in from Fulfill the Dream. $5 Super Chat question for Bell. Can you name one church father who advocated preterism in the first five centuries of Christianity? Okay, first of all, I really have a problem calling the people who lived after the uh, inspiration of the New Testament, after the close of the New Testament, church fathers. They're not church fathers, they're church children. The fathers of the church are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those who were um, the, the prophets, etc. Those are the ones that the Bible calls the fathers. I think a problem that we have is going to these uninspired men who are contradict themselves over and over again, trying to build doctrines based on the things that they say. Now, granted, many of them spoke about a future coming of Christ. We don't deny that. But you can look at Tertullian, and Tertullian quoted Daniel's 70 weeks being fulfilled in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. He gave every king of Rome uh, in, in the process and said that happened. And he said that was when God sealed up vision and prophecy. Now, what you got there is a contradiction in Tertullian. The same thing you have is with Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr quotes Matthew 24 and says that that was being fulfilled in the future, which most people say was uh, at least the first 34 verses was fulfilled in 70 AD. Uh, Justin Martyr takes that and, and puts the tribulation or some parts of it. Uh, I have to go back and look at my notes and puts it in the future. But here's something that he does say. He says, there are many who are called faithful Christians who believe that when a person dies, he goes straight to heaven. And uh, there are some other comments that he made. Now, on one hand, he called them heretics, which I can understand that. People call me a heretic. They call Jesus a heretic. They call Paul a heretic. Did it make it so? He acknowledged that there were some people who did not believe and advocate what he believed. And he called some of them faithful Christians. They held preterist views. I'm not saying they were... Uh, any more complete in what they understood than Justin Martyr or any of the rest of them were. Here's one thing John uh, Chrysostom said, I think that was that was him, he said that Jesus should already have come because the gifts have ceased, and they ceased in 70 AD, 40 years, Micah 7, 15, Acts 7, 30, et cetera, Matthew 28, 20, and I believe that's what that text is talking about because when you parallel Mark 16, 20, it says Jesus ascended to heaven, but he was working with the apostles through the signs following. So when it says that he was with them until the end of the age, that's talking about through the gifts that he had, he had given them. So from that perspective, they have conflicting views. I'm not going to build my doctrine or try to find support from them. I'll read them. I'll study them. I'll find what's practical. But the Bible says the faith was once delivered to the saints in Jude 3. It was complete. It was uh, full, didn't need any additions or, uh, or subtractions. And that's why people are so messed up with eschatology and why we got all these different views, because they don't think the scriptures are sufficient, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, to give us the truth we need. Peter said he gave us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And I think that's enough. Thank you, William. Uh, Sam, over to you. If there's anything you'd like to add to the question, go ahead. So can you name one church father who advocated full preterism in the first place? No, there's not one. Um, simple as that. Uh, the situation that Mr. Bell just described is like today. The scriptures do not teach everything on Daniel 70. It just gives Daniel 70 weeks. And then uh, that's it. It's found in one place. Uh, do with it what you will. And they have, including the Jews. They were trying to figure that one out too, all over the place. Uh, Book of Revelation. Has that yielded one single monolithic interpretation? 
new. Uh, the man of sin. Has that yielded one single monolithic early church fathers? Nobody's disagree. No, it's a mess. As William just described. Because Paul doesn't go into He just one little place and then that's it. That's, that's the only place, you know, very notorious. I'm writing a book on Second Thessalonians right now. So I'm neck deep in the literature and it's it's amazing. Uh, take, pick another topic. Pick, pick something out, you know, anything. So they were all over the place, right? Just like it is kind of today. However, I'll tell you what they weren't saying. They weren't saying that the resurrection of the dead was in 70 AD. They weren't saying that. And the earliest attestations that we have who lived through and knew, because you can't visit Rome in 81 AD and not see this big, giant, huge Arch of Titus. I mean, the destruction of Jerusalem was broadcast by the Romans. They were proud of that one. They they put it on their coins. I mean, they, they put this thing everywhere. When they, when they did that, so the whole Roman world would know, we just crushed these people over here. Do not defy us. Because this will what this is what's going to happen to you. So it, they use that to send a very strong message to the rest of the world. Do not defy us, Romans, or we will crush you. We will crush you. So everybody understood that. All the church spot, they, they understood that Jerusalem was destroyed. Yet not one of them links it to the resurrection of the dead of 1 Corinthians 15. Not one. That's that's that. <sighs> That's pretty significant. In fact, the earliest attestation that we have in First Clement, written in the late first century, reading First Corinthians 15, he uses the seed analogy exactly in the way that Paul does, but First Clement is clearly using it in the way that we traditionalists are using it, because that's what the Greek text of which Clement, who's reading Greek, understands his native language, reading the Greek of First Corinthians 15. That's what he got out of it. And interestingly enough, in the second century Mishnah Talmud, Babylon. 90 folio B, they use the seed example. So the rabbinical scholars use the exact same example that Paul does in 1 Corinthians 15. And they meant for it resurrection body. We know what they meant for it. There's not a Jewish rabbi that would disagree what Sanhedrin 90 B represents in the Jerusalem Talmud. Not one. So they understood what it meant. The, the message got out. Now, as to Daniel's 70 weeks, as to what Jesus uh, meant, the uh, kingdom of God is there. As to the man of sin is, uh, the, 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 okay, I'll give you those. Because the Bible does not give us explicit definitions of these things. They're up for debate. And we can debate about these things. But here's one thing that they, not, none, none of them, none of them, is that the resurrection of the dead in 1 Corinthians 15 happened in 70 AD. Not one, not one. We have nothing. Nothing until Max King in the late 1960s begins to posit this idea that the corporate body view of 1 Corinthians 15 is that it's the first it's the first time we ever see it. It's the first time. So no, the answer to the question is is that no. Why not? These are native Greek speaking people that read their own language just in the late first century, and we have nothing, nothing whatsoever. You expect to find something, something. Give me something. But you know, archaeology, it doesn't prove anything. But man, it helps. <laughs> it helps. And so Ed Stevens came up with the view that the reason why we don't have any church fathers saying anything is because they were raptured out in 70 AD. That's another full preterist view. They were raptured. So you have this mass disappearance of Christians around the Roman world. And nobody witnessed that either. Nobody knew that grandma was gone. I'm done. Okay, thank you, Sam. William, question was for you, so you can have uh, the final word. Go ahead. Okay. Um, you know, once again, um, all of these views that we even have today with all of these centuries of so-called orthodoxy, look at what they have revealed. They haven't revealed unity among the people who have eschatological views. That's why we got post-millennialism, amillennialism, pre-millennialism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, some of those views advocating killing people, killing children, and um, uh, any other kind of, of uh, inhuman atrocity to be, uh, you know, wreaked on people and uh, wrought on people, I guess. 
uh, who uh, are even considered as Christians. As I heard Sam say in another video that, you know, the Palestinians, et cetera. Well, you got people out there basically clapping. Yeah, let's kill them. Let's get rid of them, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, what is that doing? That that doesn't attest to the uh, validity of the doctrine itself. And and, and concerning commentaries, you, you can see I got a bunch of them, too, on the other wall, et cetera. Just like Sam, we got a bunch of them. But I had a, a, an older preacher who's passed on once, and uh, he, when I was a young preacher, um, he called me in, and we had a conversation about this eschatology. And here's what he said. He says, when I was a young man, I saw some of the same things that you see. He said, but I pulled the commentary off my shelf, and it said something different. So I abandoned my independent thinking and decided to follow the commentary. I looked him straight in the eye. I said, when I saw it, I picked up a commentary and the commentary said something different than what the Bible said. I put the commentary back on the shelf and decided I was going to stay with the Bible. So that's my opinion about, you know, commentaries, et cetera. I'm not demeaning them. You know, I got too much money invested in them. And yes, I read them and study them, but I'm not going to use any man's view to say whether he believed this or whether he believed that, that is going to determine what the scriptures say. You got to do that by logic and reason and uh, trying to come to the right conclusions based on scripture. And that's not relegated to any group of people at any group of time. It's whenever. And, and one thing I'll just say lastly, and that is it wasn't Max King. He might have been the first to advocate a covenant body view. I'm not sure about that, but he certainly wasn't the first one to advocate that these things were fulfilled in 70 AD along the journey of restoration. Now, here's the point that I'd like to make concern, concern that in addition is that the process of recovering truth has not been an overnight experience. It's been a journey all the way through, starting with uh, Luther and others who came after taking one bit of truth that had fallen by the wayside and trying to pull it back in, and they were not perfect in what they were doing. And this process continues. The problem is most people think they have arrived. Look, in the study of this debate, I learned some things that I didn't know, and I'm going to keep learning things that I don't know because I don't ever consider that I have reached the end of that. But nevertheless, that's the way I, I feel about that. And um, I'm going to keep trusting scripture over and above any man living or dead uh, as far as the final authority for my understanding. Thank you for that final word, William. Gentlemen, uh, great endurance from the both of you. We have made it to the final question. We have honored the uh, Super Chats for tonight. And the audience has been very engaged. You've really kept the attention of everybody for three and a half hours. We've still got over 110 people live enjo uh, in enjoying you guys engaging the, this topic. So with that, final question for tonight uh, comes in from Lazarus. Conley, thank you for uh, all the support tonight. And it's a question for the both of you. And so, uh, Sam, we'll start with you on this one since William started with the previous one. And the question is, how are you part of the resurrection of the dead if the elect all got elected and all the raised got raised in 70 AD? Uh, my other debate with Michael Miano, who more or less follows the the view of, of Mr. Bell and, and Don Preston um, is, is that it does not apply. Uh, Michael Miano said that flat out, as William said tonight, it doesn't, the, the resurrection there in that passage of John 6 does not apply to you today. Um, I'm not going to be, in William Bell's view, I'm not going to be raised from the dead. I, that's, that does not apply. That language does not apply to me at all. It only applied to that first century. That was it. And it's done. It's fulfilled and it's over with. So the resurrection has passed already. Um, if you can just understand what it takes to get to say that statement in the present time, the resurrection is passed already. Because that's that's what's being argued. That's what's being said. Now, how in the world with everything you think that you know about resurrection? So you have to unravel all that. All that's got to be unraveled. Everything you read, everything you said. And I'm, you know, William, I'm just a man that reads the scriptures just like First Clement and Irenaeus and Justin Martyr and everybody else. And my reading of the scripture is no more superior than yours. Or what makes my reading more superior or your reading more superior? Or that you understand the Bible. This is what the Bible says. And, I, well, I, I, am I reading the Bible and saying, boy, it really does say 70 AD there, but 
God, I got to I got to toe the line over here. Now you're accusing my heart. I'm not reading it that way. I've been in your shoes. I understand your view. I, I'm not, I, I know how a full preterist will read. I wrote a book on it, it's still published, how a full preterist will read that text. And now I read it in another way because I am fallible. I am wrong. I, I understand and get what that means. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm much freer now to read the text. Read, read the text. I'm, I'm freer. I'm not locked in. It's got to be 70 AD. Got to be 70 AD. Got to be 70 AD. Can't get away from 70 AD. Well, I'm not locked in a slave to that anymore. But if you are, uh, resurrection no longer applies. I don't like anything restricting my reading. I, I want, I, I do want the scriptures to say what it is that they say. I don't want models and systems and frameworks uh, saying you got to read it this way. Yeah, but that's not what it's saying. How? Oh, but the framework says. I, I, I don't want to do that. So it, it is a. It, it's been clearly shown tonight that resurrection and this being the elect and all that, uh, Lazarus, none of that applies to us today in the full preterist world. So it's just a past conversation for past people that lived 2000 years ago. And um, it doesn't apply. So we don't even, there's no point in even bringing it up or talking about it. Thank you for the response, Sam, William, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay. I want to Clarify that statement so that it's not misunderstood. When I refer to John 6, 39 and 40 and all those passages there, I'm talking about the resurrection of the dead ones that was fulfilled at the end of the age, according to Matthew 13, 39 and 40, and uh, the rest of the passages that we have mentioned. So keeping that in the context, uh, that's what that's referring to. We don't have any more Old Testament dead saints from that perspective. Uh, so we can't say, if that's what 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about, we don't have the liberty to make the dead ones something else. Sam is not a pre-cross saint. He is. He didn't live before the cross and therefore was a part of that group of dead ones whose resurrection was being denied. So why go there and then try to force yourself into that text of which there is no way possible you could ever be among Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and Job, and all the rest of them in your eschatological paradigm. It will never work. Those are the people that are mentioned there in that context. Um, he said that, you know, he used to be a preterist and he knows all about it. I heard Sam say the other day uh, when they asked him about what he his view was, he said, well, I guess if I have to ca categorize myself, I'm an amillennial. Well, guess what? I used to be a non-millennial. I understand that position. And I'm no longer one because of things that I find uh, in the scripture as far as that is concerned. And then to th uh, throw out the con the term or the phrase, the resurrection is passed al already. Well, from one perspective, that almost, um, you know, that's kind of like throwing 2 Timothy 2, 18 and 19 in there. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 18 and 19 was what I would call a true hyperpreterist, because at the time they wrote that, that was before the temple was destroyed. See, our view is not that resurrection was completely fulfilled before that. That's what some people say. They say, well, you already have spiritual resurrection. Now you're going to get a body resurrection sometimes later. And they will advocate that. And I even pointed out that at the parousia of the coming of Christ, Romans 11, 27, he would take away their sins. But 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, just like 2 Thessalonians, talks about the believers. Um, on the one hand, you had those who were basically Judaizers, but I think the church was honestly mistaken in 2 Thessalonians 2. But here's what Paul did. Paul talked about the man of sin who was in the temple of God. The only temple reference they had at the time was the temple that was in Jerusalem. So the man of sin was sitting in that temple. We can't take that out of the text. And it was that man of sin who would be destroyed at the coming of the Lord. So we, ha we have to keep that from that perspective. Now, here's what they believe. They believe that the coming of Christ had already occurred. If they believe the coming of Christ had already occurred, since that's con a constituent element of the end time, it would mean the judgment had occurred, the resurrection had occurred, and 
they could not then have possibly even associated a physical body resurrection with the coming of the Lord because they were still on the earth. It hadn't burned up. Uh, uh, no bodies had come out of the ground and uh, they didn't all go somewhere and stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Their view of resurrection is not what Paul addressed, Their the nature. He addressed the timing. He says, that day shall not come except there is a falling away first, the apostasy, and the man of sin is revealed, whom the Lord will destroy at the parousia of his epiphania, the manifestation of a hidden divinity. First Timothy chapter six, I think verse 15 or 16, also second Timothy four, one, the manifestation of a hidden divinity. That's what's be, what was being revealed. And there had to be something revealed in to the senses that people could understand or see whether they heard about it or whether they saw it and experienced it in order for them to know that Christ had come. And that's what the scriptures teach. And that did happen with the fall of the temple from that perspective. And you don't even need Josephus to prove that because if you believe the word of God, then you know he said what he said. He said the gospel would not end. All flesh is as grass, all the glory of uh, uh the grass and the flower fades away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the gospel which is preached to you. So we have a gospel that has no end. God never does anything without purpose. That gospel is for the salvation of men, for saving men. So I'll, I'll end on that. Thank you very much, uh, William, for that response. Uh, Sam, we'll give you the final, uh, let's say, minute for this question. And go ahead. Well, um, do not be amazed that this time is a coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good will rise to live and those who have done evil will rise. There's a resurrection of the evil, by the way. And those who will done evil uh, will rise uh, to be condemned. So when is that going to happen? I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and whoever eats of my flesh, I will raise him up in the last day. So let me let me read John 5. Do not be amazed. The time is coming when all who are in their tombs will hear his voice and will come out. That's the language that's used for Jesus' resurrection, by the way. He came out of the tomb. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. When is that going to happen? Well, just flip the page. No one can come to me unless by the Father who has sent me draws him, I will raise him up in the last day. Um, that's that's a pretty good... That, does, that doesn't require uh, gymnastics. That, that's, that's a pretty... Uh, but if you got 70 AD going on, you got to do a lot of gymnastics, man, to make to make all that work. You, you got to do because everything that Jesus said. So the dead, uh, the dead ones, same ones here in First Corinthians 15, will come out of their tombs, including the evil. So this is the judgment of the of the evil. So in John chapter 12, Jesus talks about the condemnation of the judgment of the wicked in the last day. So the wicked, what about the wicked? Did they get raised from the dead? Were they changed? Because all the will all be changed. Everyone's going to be changed, including the unjust. The the judgment of the unjust and the just, both. And John sees them all standing before the throne at the very end of the vision. All great and small standing before the throne, and they are judged. Second Corinthians chapter five, we shall all stand before the throne and be judged. It's a, it's, it's a single continuous picture that is given time and time again. And the only difference between me and William is, is that William has all of that done and complete and fulfilled in 70 AD. Sorry, folks, you missed it. Bye bye. You got to reinvent the whole thing because that end that you thought that everything in history was pushing towards, that's that's that ain't happening. Uh, that's not happening. History is pushing towards nowhere. It's infinite. It never ends. It has no goal to it. What you see right now is what you get. Period. End of story. The whole point is when you die, you don't get raised from the dead. When you die, you go to heaven. Period. End of story. Done. 
has nothing to do with creation, has nothing to do with this earth, has nothing to do with your biology, biology, has nothing to do with funerals, it doesn't have anything to do with cancer, crying, tears, nothing whatsoever at all. Nothing, nothing. It's die, go to heaven. Jesus just wants to pack heaven full of souls. That's his whole goal. That's his whole mission. So sin, death, evil, destruction, whatever is going to be on earth for infinity. It'll never end. No one's literally coming out of the graves or out of the dust of the earth. That's all metaphorical, allegorical, apocalyptic language, symbolic language for the spiritual covenantal, invisible Gnostic world of the esoteric and the spiritual that's almost entirely completely divorced from the life here and now that everybody else understands and recognizes the Bible speaking to. That, that's what you have to get into. That's what I was involved with and I was a full preterist. So if you ask me about my drinking or my alcoholism, I said, that's just a sin of the flesh. That has nothing to do with my perfection that is in Jesus Christ. See how that works? I've got every excuse in the book, man. Because the redemption of this flesh has nothing to do with my redemption that is complete, perfected in Jesus Christ. Flesh, the, the betterment of my flesh has zero to do with the perfection that is in Christ. It has, see, that's the full preterist world. That's why you got some full preterist running around doing what it is that they do. And I did some of that stuff with them when I was at the conferences. Because sin is not fleshly anymore. It has nothing to do with that. It's all covenantal. Everything was fulfilled. You're in the new covenant. You're in the new heavens and the new earth. You are a new creation, period. End of story. Done. Nothing you can do will ever. It's not problematic anymore. You're, you are perfected in Jesus Christ. You're in the new heavens and new earth. You're in the age to come. Heck, the law doesn't even apply to you anymore. Five you don't seconds, have sin or death or any of that. Because death, spiritual death, that's been swallowed up in victory. So sin doesn't reign in death because you are not in death anymore. Death doesn't have anything to do with you. Now, if you want to live right. in that world, go ahead, but not me. I left it. Sam, thank you for that final response. Gentlemen, excellent Q&A. Very informative, very comprehensive. I think we uh, doubled the uh, agreed upon 30 minutes, but I think that was necessary because the nature of this topic is it is a comprehensive topic yeah. and it has been one of our main events. And so firstly, to the audience, I do want to apologize if we didn't get to your question. I'm telling you, if we would have gotten to all the questions, we would be uh, debating yeah. until midnight tomorrow. And so <laughs> we did get through as many as we could. We honored all the donations. And William and Sam, uh, you both did a fantastic job engaging uh, engaging these questions. So I really do uh, appreciate your time, nearly four hours of your time. Uh, William and Sam, you both put a lot of work and time into this debate. And there's been a lot of hype. There's been a lot of excitement for this. And, and you didn't let us down. So I really enjoyed this. Gentlemen, let's get some final that. words, final thoughts. William. Uh, let's start with you again. Thank you so much uh, for doing this. It really was a, a pleasure to host this debate. And so some final words, final thoughts. Well, first of all, let me thank you, uh, Donny, for uh, doing an excellent job of moderating this debate. And uh, I've enjoyed several of the debates that I've watched on your channel, and I really appreciate the, the uh, manner in which you uh, you carry this out. It's it's good to be in an environment where it's peaceful and where you can just talk and without um, uh, any of the negativity that comes uh, from those situations. Let me thank my colleague, uh, Dr. Sam Frost, <clears throat> for honoring me with the opportunity to uh, sit with me for these four hours and discuss these matters. Um, the fact that we differ is not going to change my love for him. And uh, I hope and pray that uh, as we continue to work, we continue to you know, grow and learn uh, in the process. Uh, we strongly disagree about uh, some of these things, about a lot of these things, but there are a few things that we do agree upon and you know, we'll just keep working and working and working. To the audience, let me say thank you for uh, whatever endurance you had. If you're still here, we certainly appreciate you for, uh, for doing so. Um, this was um, quite, um, an experience for me in um, trying to prepare for this discussion. I've got tons more information that I didn't get a chance to do, but I can assure you of this in upcoming videos, et cetera, 
I will be uh, presenting uh, some of the material that you didn't even get a chance to see. And you'll see some of the charts that I put together. I just, you know, in the heat of debate, didn't want to do all of that because I've had so many other other things. So I'm thankful and grateful to God for this privilege. I wish the best to all of you, to the audience, and uh, look forward to another opportunity in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, William, for those kind words and those uh, final thoughts and, and final words. Uh, hopefully we can have you back on in the future to uh, engage some more of that uh, data and, and information that, that you've come up with. So, uh, Sam, thank you as well for your time. I really do appreciate it uh, for the both of you. This was your first time here on uh, Standing for Truth, and I really uh, just enjoyed this debate all around. So, Sam, uh, thanks again. And some final words, final thoughts. No, just uh, thanks for William uh, going this long. I think this is one of the longest one I've I've ever done. This is uh, you know, four four hours. Um, you know, I was telling my wife, oh, it'll be a couple of hours. I'll be all right. We doubled it. <laughs> got, it turned know, they're into they're a tapping, conference, gentlemen. Yeah, that they're tapping her foot, thinking, huh? What? You know, it's a, it's a Friday night. Um, so uh, thank you, also, Donnie, uh, having me on there, and I hope you know, to hear feedback and stuff like that. And so, and to continue in this and all that I ask for those, anybody listening is just keep an open, just, you know, we, we, uh, you know, just, I, I've learned in my years, you know, thinking that I've got it this time, this time I got it. Um, and God keeps saying, no, you don't, <laughs> you're not even close. And that's what I am enjoying you know, walking with the Lord. So that hearing these discussions and two different perspectives on things, uh, you know, may the Holy Spirit do what it is that he does and uh, appreciate the time and you hosting and the, the labor, Donnie, that you're doing. So, yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure. We couldn't have so many of these awesome debates if we didn't have uh, guests like you willing to give us four hours of your time. William, you uh, just did without an air conditioner. He doesn't yeah, even have a four hour <laughs> debate without an air conditioner. So that is I don't know uh, how he did. <laughs> I, I got a fan blowing like the cold air from yeah. I, I got I got a fan blowing cold air from <laughs> downstairs up here, but it's not getting much up here. But anyway, yeah, that's it. And well, I got two big like lights ready for right it. in front of me. Well, you, you gentlemen look like you're ready for another four hours. So we'll give no. you a five minute uh, rest. I'm just kidding. Okay. So with that, William, Sam, thank you so much for uh, a very memorable debate, a comprehensive debate. I am looking forward to re-listening to this and just absorbing all the points and all the discussion and just all the answers you, 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 all, you both gave. So to the audience, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate the support, the super chats, the feedback, share this content around because uh, you know, these kinds of debates are important. Critical thinking is important. It gets us out of our theological echo chambers, puts us into the debate octagon where we can engage uh, these issues. So with that, uh, we're going to wrap things up. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, Standing for Truth is out. God bless. <laughs>